movements to peace processes and today we will talk about the transformative power of collective memory and why is memory work important. At this panel the discussion will be held on the contribution of collective memory to coexistence, how memory studies can transform human rights in the historical context and what kind of a role can collective memory and the past and the present injustices play in shaping the public narratives. So the discussions in this panel are Eylem Delikanlı from Research Institute on Turkey and since 2018 with Anadolu Culture uh, Anadolu Culture Foundation project uh, head Research Institute on uh, Turkey Aylin Tekiner and Nevin uh, Soykaya from Diyarbakır Association for the Protection of Cultural and Natural Assets, and we have Arlin Bartanyan from Boğaziçi University. The panel will be moderated by Hayat Karaköse from Hranting Foundation. Hello everyone, welcome to our panel on the transformative power of collective memory, why is memory work important? As you know, memory work and practices of facing challenging past practices and spaces of memory are becoming more and more important. Maybe we need to start by asking the question, is it enough to remember only or not to forget? Remembering is a form of resistance against time, against forgetting, and memory work resists against forgetting and make remembering collective for coexistence, equality, peace, and justice. Hranting came up with uh, a recommendation in one of his articles, he said those who still defend forgetting are those who are not afraid of the past, but who they, they are afraid of the future. So based on this, we need to say that memory work has many other functions other than uh, making people remember certain things. Work in this field make the information taken away from people accessible and it provides an alternative discourse and help us understand things better, ask questions that we haven't asked before. And it also further encourages dialogue, empathy and mutual understanding. And it creates a space for communication and contact. Memory work is also related to search for justice and truth. Many of the truth uh, spaces and justice spaces in the world are also venues for activism. Past is in the past. Let's open a new page. Start from here. Look at the future. This type of an understanding is still defended by some people, especially the politicians. However, the thing is when it's when we forget memory work or spaces of memory, the past still continues to shape today and we are not able to shape the future based on our past learnings. And all the studies show us that opening a new page is not about forgetting, but it's about remembering and facing. So in this session, we have very distinguished guests working in the field of memory. They are really inspiring all of us and we will talk about the today of memory work, the opportunities brought by memory work, importance of archives and it, uh, the relation with arts. So we will be discussing all these questions. And I would like to start with a general question. Well, we all have a concern, maybe a wound uh, that we want to find a remedy for. 
So according to you, memory work and places of memory, what kind of opportunities do they bring for us? What kind of contribution they can make for finding remedies for the past wounds? And how can we have a transformative approach? Hello, everyone, and thank you. Nayat, well, you actually made a very nice introduction. Memory is very useful because it helps us come to terms with the past. This way, we do not forget about the past through memory work, through archives. We don't forget about the past. And we should not forget about the past. Only if we can come to terms with the past, we can heal. And for that, we have to face the past, some painful and traumatic experiences have to be confronted with. So if we can uh, do that, and if we can get healed through this, then we can say that we are in peace with the past and we have a more confidence, confident stance against the future. And we can become a healthier society. All this can be possible through memory work. And apart from the official history, if we can create the alternative discourse, the the discourse that gives us the facts and uh, truth, only if we can transform and convey it to future for the work of the historians and researchers, and if we can uh, give young people an opportunity to understand the past, then countries like Turkey, who had traumatic experiences in their past, who are not able to talk about the past, and who have problems with their pasts, then we can uh, say that memory work can uh, become a very positive thing. That's why it's very important. First of all, I also would like to thank you for your invitation. What we can say is that in countries like Turkey, where there is a very deep-rooted state tradition, which also is full of pain and sorrows, as the state is not facing with anything. In countries like this, memory work is, tr in a way, trying to fill in a gap. This is an important effort, an important initiative. I wish we had um, a mechanism that was functioning better, but through memory work, we are able to archive certain things. And all the reality of the past, even though it's disturbing, even though it's disclosing the sins and crimes of the state, it's very important to reveal these. And just like Nayat said, I also would like to join her in saying that people who are born into that trauma because of their family uh, past made more efforts to become a part of the memory work. However, now, our, in our country, things have changed so much that children, the new generation, are born into the trauma. That's why there, there is now a platform that they feel they belong to in the memory work. I don't know if it is necessarily a good thing or a bad thing, we can discuss this, but memory work both nationally and internationally uh, is really filling an important gap, as I said. Okay, thank you. This is uh, my first panel after I I arrived from New York, and I'm very happy to be here. Let me continue from what the previous speakers have said. I think the question uh, is very important. Can memory work provide a remedy for the future? As a person who has been working in this field for a long time, I don't think that the work itself alone provides a remedy. But it provides open ways to find a remedy. What do I mean by this? Of course, in many fields, we have valuable work carried out in Turkey, especially just like Eileen mentioned, for healing the wounds of past remedies, 
Many painful events have happened in this country, for instance. Most of us maybe came here in the morning walking. Just imagine how many uh, places of memory you have uh, walked by this morning. I walked here from Gümüşsuyu. I passed through at least six, five, six places of memory. Taksim Square, for instance, Kazancı Hill, Gezi Park, Istanbul Radio, the city theater. On my way to this venue, there were so many places, places of memory, and many different segments of the society passed through different resistance activities uh, in those places. So those in power are trying to stop certain struggles, but these places were places of struggles. So it's not only about healing the wounds or establishing trans, uh, transitional justice, but these places also are important and effective spaces and venues for making a connection with the past. We can maybe call it memory activism. Although they don't present the remedy itself to us, they really help us find what the remedy is. I have a presentation. Can you please bring my slide on the screen because I have a quote to share with you. So I will take you back to 1945. Of course, since then we've made great progress. However, I would like to quote the words of writer Sebald. Can we have the presentation on the screen, please? Next slide. Sebald says after 1945 as an answer to what literature should be. He's from Germany. During Adenauer times, he says, memory work is about forgetting the past. So even now when I try to remember, the darkness doesn't lift but becomes yet heavier as I think how little we can hold in mind how everything uh, is constantly lapsing into oblivion with every extinguished life. I think this quote is very important. It's, it's very, very emotional. So he goes on to say how the world is, as it were, draining itself in that the history of countless pieces and objects which themselves have no power of memory is never heard, never described, or never passed on, he says. Zebat. Of course, since 1945, we made great progress. However, the practices of violence that we had in the past brought along policies of forgetting. And these policies are not only destroying people, buildings, and places. As Nazlı Temir Beryan has said in her most recent work, they also restructure the everyday life in that building space or person, and they prevent the transfer of memory from one generation to another. This rupture, in a way, also prevents social healing. When memory is healed and it cannot be transferred from one generation to another, it's very difficult to continue working on this. I don't know if there is a remedy uh, for this, but I would like to talk about uh, how we can connect it with art through some inspiring examples. However, the starting point might be uh, actually pointing out these ruptures, actually putting a name to these ruptures. And 
memory shall not be confined to linear time, we shouldn't say that past is past, we should forget, let's look at the future. No, instead of this, what we call as memory rupture would only continue if we do this, because the past is never in the past. It's very important to look into past and as much as what we remember, how we remember it is also important. And let me stop here. Okay, so the relation between art and memory, maybe we can also discuss that because you have work in this field. Because participation, counter monuments, collective uh, commemoration forms, are becoming more and more important and we see that there is a lot of uh, inspiring and innovative work carried out here. So I'll ask you, anyone inspiring you in the most recent years that you loved and that make a contribution to collective memory building? What are the uh, works of art that you would like to share with us? Okay, I can't use this. I don't know how it's working. So I have chosen examples from three different countries, but as I work in the field of art, I would like to present you some concepts, concepts first. One is the concept of poiesis. Aristotle, in his period of, in his process of experimenting the world, this is what he uh, uses to understanding the world after uh, praxis. Then we have communitas. So we have communitas, which is all about coming together for a purpose, to create structures that don't exist, to make a contribution to the transformation of the society based on the needs of that society. So it's about creating uh, communitas. So, poesis is also in a process including communitas. I chose uh, three examples, three countries with a uh, violent past. One is Cambodia. You see Anchon Pond uh, on this slide. The Red Kimmer's regime, after the Red Kimmer's regime in Cambodia, first, the Pol Pot regime that was in power had these uh, child uh, soldiers army. He was a part of that army. Somehow he was able to escape that violent atmosphere. He was adopted by an American family and Anchon Pond finds himself in US and life is not e easy uh, in US anyway for him because he's a Cambodian, maybe you would remember in the Cambodian regime, the intellectuals, religious leaders, artists, and civil servants were targeted, and his family were the managers of the national uh, charity co company, uh, an opera group, so he lost his parents during the regime, Pol Pot regime. However, this opera uh, tradition and Cambodian music, he started a work to revive uh, these. He tried to perform traditional Cambodian music and transfer the musical memory to new generations. Cambodian living arts uh, was established by him to reach out to young people. So you can actually search for it, Cambodian living arts. They are giving scholarships, training programs, workshops, and Kaimar Magic Bus uh, is another initiative that they have. They are reaching out to the remotest villages of Cambodia. So this collective memory, a musical memory that is that was lost, is now uh, brought back to uh, our day, and they transfer the traditional music. Cambodian traditional music to young people, so actually he was able to build that uh, link that was broken. The second example from it is, is from Argentina, a photographer, Marcelo Brodsky. His project is titled Good Memory. 
He was born in Argentina in 1954. After the military coup in 1976, he migrates to Spain. And during the coup, he lo loses his brother and his closest friend. He goes to Barcelona. About 20 years later, he shows the courage to go back to Argentina and he starts going through his family photos from the past and he finds one of the this photo here he is from he's at the 8th grade at middle school he's with friends he finds his friends in this photo one by one and he actually takes their photos again and as you can imagine there are friends that he cannot reach because there is this dirty war in Argentina and he ha they lost most of these people during the war. Brodsky already has an existing communitas, his high school friends. He revives them. He talks to the school administration and suggests starting an exhibition. His school is a very important school Colegio Nacional in Argentina and the class of 1968 whoever is left from that year gets together so they actually remember the names of those and celebrate them so they're not lost anymore and for the new generation they transfer those who were categorized as lost. Doris Salcedo or Salcedo from Colombia is my final example. Colombia is a country that is woven with violence both in the past and now. Salcedo has associational works of art but I believe in the context of our topic the most inspiring work is in a square the Plaza de Bolivar Square of Colombia. So this is, there is the Justice Building, the City Council Building in the square. In one night, Plaza de Bolivar hosts 20,000 candles by Salcido. She tries to do that with 20 assistants. It's in fact an impossible project. There's no existing communitas here but there is an ongoing violence so it's a mourning invitation for this violence and in 2007 in order to pressure the Colombian government there is an organization called FARC and they're actually having this action to criticize political, um, some political wrongdoing. So Salcidas says the following. As an artist, she criticized her own role. I don't think art can solve problems. I can't do anything for these families or vi victims. And when we talk about art that is trying to address these political issues, we need to face the fact that art doesn't have the capability of being a savior, but it has the capability of demonstrating them. So by morning, there is the creation of a spontaneous communitas by Salcido. It's very impressive. And in fact, it is a work that includes this participation Notion, so I hope there will be further examples of this kind. Navy In 2005, there were some clashes in Diyarbakir. There was this collapse in Sur, so there was this destruction of a whole um, city. And unfortunately, the new generations will face a completely different Sur because it is not there anymore. I re visited it recently and I'm thinking I was lucky I had the chance to see the previous state of Sur. I experienced that feeling and that history, but unfortunately, a lot of people who haven't seen Sur, they won't know anything. But you actually exerted great efforts to fight against that. You worked through archives, 
So the in order to transfer the memory of sort of future generations, in order to shed light to that memory, in order to demonstrate what was lived there, uh, that multicultural life, you published a book, you held an art exhibition, you have different projects and events, and it's not easy to do any of this. So it's really worth all kinds of appreciation. At this point, I would like to talk about archives because in collective work, a beginning point that is usually disregarded is archives, but everything starts with the archives. So what kind of work did you carry out, you know, in those tough conditions? There are rights violations that are still going on. You, you continue under these circumstances. So what is the feeling behind that? Yes, our trauma or our near trauma is sur. The trauma never ends, but sur is indeed a very live for all the people of the Arabic. It's an ongoing trauma. Of course, it started in 2015 October and the clash continued until March 2016. There was destruction, there was reconstruction, but it was impossible. We call it the destruction of cities because Sur is a city, it is the heart of the Arabukur, it's the historic site. That was the case for Nusaibin and Jizre and Shirnak. So there are tens of historical cities that are destroyed. Why is it a massacre? Because we have understood later that everything was planned through one center. First it was criminalized and then the cities were destroyed and they were turned into flat fields. And these are historic cities too. So they were turned into flat fields, they were built, brought down. They said we do infrastructural work and they also killed the layers below the cities. So they made reconstruction impossible through new construction. So they actually deleted the collective memory or they tried to do so. They tried to do this through this area. So it's a serious traumatic wound. Did they just kill that site? No, they also killed the human life there. For one thing, it's a living area, so people were forced to migrate, thousands of people, and they embezzled their property, they lost their property overnight, these people. And they lost everything, and they need to go elsewhere and try to build a new life under very tough circumstances. And on the other hand, yes, let's talk about Sur. It wasn't just those venues that were lost. It was also the collective memory, the social memory. That was a serious problem. Of course, Sur, the Arbaker Fort and Ifsa Gardens are world heritage. I used to be a museum worker and this city needs an archive. It's a historic city. We couldn't find data and we were planning work around that, but it would never happen. And recently in the municipality, we initiated this work with Osman Kavala. We decided to do something, but as soon as that started, there was this trustee that came and so we decided to do it with an NGO after the trustee and as of June 2018 in the digital environment we have the, the Arbaker City Archive. We call it the Arbaker City Archive but of course we focused on Sur. Of course we try to document what we've lost, we try to compile the data and we focused on creating new documents because we lost something very important. You had this emotion when you visited, we always have this emotion. I know Sur, but then the people after me, the children won't know about it. There is this lack of identity, lack of infrastructure in Sur now. So the Sur culture, the Arabic culture, it has nothing to do with that, this artificial city that they created. And in fact, this city imposes the idea that this is what the Arabukur is on children. So those children who don't know about the past of the city will think that this is what the city is all about. This will weaken their sense of belonging for the future. But these structures and cities without identity will evolve the culture and life to something different. 
so that architectural design will turn the society into something else. But this is at the same time a serious violation of human rights. And it's also a bloody destruction that we've experienced. So the archive work that we started in 2018 doesn't exist. Uh, I mean, we said we have to do this after Sur, we said. It's very difficult because the trauma goes on, the pressure goes on. Quote, unquote, the urban transformation, in fact, keeps destroying the city. After Sur, there were two neighborhoods where there was no clash and they did the same there. And there was this Ferit Kösk neighborhood. They are doing the same there. And there is Balar. They started to do the same there. They did this in Binusan. So it's all across the city. There is this destruction and rebuilding and you know, confiscating the property of people, kicking them out of that area. So they're trying to create a new society through this um, location in a way. So it just creates a trauma. It just actually exacerbates the existing pain. And it actually adds further layers on social wounds. It's still very difficult to speak for two reasons. One, the pressure that the power um, creates. In fact, it's not just those in power, but all those that create the violence. They create this pressure that prevents you from speaking. And the trauma still goes on. People are not comfortable to speak. Last year, there was a program to support rights. And the women in Sur, you know, uh, in their new lives, what did they experience after this destruction? We wanted to talk to them, to document them. So our colleague who conducted the study, her psychology was devastated because every conversation ended with a crying fit because it's all very fresh. So retelling this was creating a problem. And for the person who listened, it was also difficult. But we realized we had to do this because, and we are glad we did this. Why? The people that we talked to had a lot of difficulty talking. They cried, but they kept on talking. We wanted to interrupt, but they said, no, I want to tell this because it healed them to talk about it, they said. So that's work led to this result and memory is something that you forget over time it doesn't stay the same because human is not a computer human memory is not a computer you change the story you transform it emotions are involved a lot of things affect the memory and it transforms it so that's why we wanted to hear the truth when it's so fresh just to know what people actually went through so that's what we're doing in order to record this memory, we are creating the city archive. This is our main project, coming to your question. So our main project is the archive. But to support the archive, we do other work to obtain data to enrich this archive. So we look at the near term. And Diyarbakir, and this is true for Turkey in general, but Diyarbakir is like a summary um, there is this violence-based, trauma-based experience all the time. And looking into that, documenting that is what we want to do. So we really do care about this. And in doing this, we want to document what is true. It shouldn't be a misleading archive. We should get the true data so that the situation can be seen from the real perspective in the future. So we just take it without processing it. We just take it as it is and transfer it to the future. That is our mission. So this is what we're trying to create. We also have this book. We distributed in the booth. We have the oral history work that is going on. And this year in 2015, we're going to work with children and teens. They used to be children back then, and now they are teenagers. So we're doing the same work with them because we saw that it was children and women who were most affected by this. So we want to get their perspective and 
we want to record what went on from their perspective. So we have a website called Diyarbakır Hafızası and there the city memory, we're trying to keep it alive. We have digital exhibitions based on different themes. We covered the past, the cultural richness, the cultural diversity, the historic depth of the city and we do this through the exhibition format. And we also have maps for memory. We have memory marches, but all these events are to display what was experienced in the city in the near or far past. We want to transfer this to the archives so that it serves academicians and researchers and those who are curious in the future. So we're trying to record the memory of the city as much as possible. I hope we can go on. Thank you for all your efforts. It's indeed a very important contribution for the field. We talked about the importance of telling because people talk about this traumatic past and it heals them and it makes them feel lighter. Elam, I want to continue with you because we're now talking about oral history. You have important work in this area. My question is, when it comes to the face of practices, how does oral history serve that? And in rights-based struggle, in human rights the advocacy, oral history is becoming more important. We used to look at data only in the past. Now we see more focus on human stories in rights advocacy. And there are some new trends, like together with digitalization, there is uh, AI, the use of AI. So how do you see the work? Why is oral history important? Why is it important to listen and communicate? Well, this is a very big question. I hope I can answer this in a short period of time. Well, of course, in different parts of the world, we have colleagues working in the field of memory. And when we get together, we feel this a lot. This work in this geography, when we start it here, we have a different type of burden. For instance, we talked about archive. I want to start from there before I answer your question. Archive is our biggest pain point. You know, if you accept archives as a political power, there is a question as to who has the power in their hands. When you want to carry out um, an oral history study about any subject, the first wall we hit is accessing the archives. So here, oral history work is not it is preferred as a method and there are several reasons for this in Turkey but I think the most important one and the most lacking one in Turkey is that the work has not been processed and turned into an archive really so it's not just the researcher but in the secondary research there is some rich work that has been done but they're not accessible that is an issue. So there is a power in oral history, at least this is how I try to conduct my work. We call it oral history for historic justice because in our country, in the legal sense, the trauma of the past, the confrontation with the past, all of these practices are not really put into effect. The legal process doesn't really function. In the search for rights, uh, the perpetrators are not penalized in the legal uh, you know, platform. So the circles who are affected by this are searching for their rights. So the perpetrators, the crimes, the rights violations, oral history is an open and democratic platform to um, discuss those. So oral history is just the moment or format where you have this talk for most people. There is a narrator, there is a researcher, 
maybe there are a few narrators, there is a dialogue between them and we listen to them. That's how it's seen, but in fact it's more than that. Together with digitization, this is processed as research data. So, oral history, contrary, contrary to qualitative or quantitative research, is a research method that provides a lot of content. There is a preliminary preparation, then there is the processing of data, there is analysis, it's open to the public sphere, it's open to the archive, it's a long and cumbersome process. And a lot of experts are involved in this process. So digitization is in the nature of oral history. In fact, technological developments are taking up an important place. It's an important step. Of course, we had the invention of recording devices, then we were able to use TV, and visual records were available, then internet came, became a part of our lives, making all these uh, accessible online in the digital platform. So these are very important things. And looking at the past oral history work, we now uh, have to focus on digitizing them and opening them up for uh, the use of researchers. Of course, AI is going to be very important for us now because you can immediately find among thousands uh, and thousands of interviews exactly what the uh, what the, what concept you're looking for. Of course, to be able to do this, all the material has to be digitized, processed, processed correctly, especially, and. Oral history as a research method has to uh, be carried out in line with the ethical uh, research methods. So we have, we don't have a lot of teams that have been able to bring together both the technology and the ethical aspect of the issue. I hope in the future we will have more people working on such archives. We have been working on such an archive for the last two years and hopefully as you have uh, done we will be able to soon uh, share it publicly on a digital platform thank you so much we look forward to seeing the results of your work Eileen, let me turn to you as an artist and as a person uh, analyzing sculptures i would like to ask you the following we have in turkey many pieces of art that were removed, destroyed, disinstalled. Looking at the history of all these uh, statues and sculptures and statues, especially Atatürk statues, uh, how uh, do you see it and what do you think is the relation of the Turkish people with uh, statues? Okay, first let me talk about the archive and then Nayat, I will answer your question. Of course, the state is very destructive in terms of this. We have been witnessing all the destruction by the state. And in this neoliberal system, we have the market relations based on capital and all these efforts trying to erase the past carelessly. And they are trying to erase our memory. And we also see a an obstacle there, which is the archive. I'll give you an example, and then I'll link it to Atatürk statues. One of the most prominent items or objects of the state in Turkey has always been, been this. In every period, especially in the coup d'etat periods, the statues of Atatürk have been instrumentalized and been of great service. And with the coup d'etat, uh, it became more and more important. So let's take a look at the inventory of such an important item or monument for the state. I tried to see the archives or the inventory of monuments in Turkey and I was so surprised because it was not existing. I went to the General Directorate of ha Fine Arts. There was um, a very, very big uh, monument that was written in the archives uh, as Atatürk statue, although it was not Atatürk statue, it was uh, from uh, some other president. But of course they have to call everything as Atatürk statue. 
So, in many places, we see the leader called and call, uh, this effort to write a glorious history. This is not only in Turkey, but in Turkey, there is this conception or perception that whenever you say statute, it's always considered as Atatürk statue. And then we have the shift in our aesthetics with transition of power to uh, Islamic municipalities, but or, there was always this uh, continuity in Atatürk's monuments. In nation-state understanding, we have this myths, iconography in the establishment of all these things. War has always been an important thing that feeds it. Victory, for instance, especially starting from the 1980s, this was somehow changed. People started to see war as something that shouldn't be understood as sacred. So what they also tried to, they also started to see monuments as unsacred things. Only in Turkey we didn't have this. And only in Turkey we didn't see this change. We continue to repeat certain practices of the uh, past and these practices also create new traumas for people. So actually these public statues or sculptures are an extension of the public trauma. In Turkey we can't do it as I said because let's remember Roboski, what happened in Roboski. Ur Kaimas, for instance, his case. Let's remember. Let's remember Ali Ismail Korkmaz, what happened to him. So We have to create a new language in this country. We need to have a new sense of aesthetics in this, century, in this country. Of course, in Turkey, the moment we say statue, immediately people think about Ataturk. So statues and sculptures are always associated with Ataturk only. We need to change this. I'll also give you an example about its relation with the society, and then I will stop. When that monument of humanity was constructed, they actually used a very wrong method. For instance, in an order that prevents talking about these things so much, uh, we have seen this monument being prepared without consulting anyone. So the monument was symbolizing a topic that had never been talked about in the society, that was uh, prevented to be talked about. So we had to have so many different stakeholders and parties to come together, consult with one another, and discuss all these issues. Uh, and that monument had to uh, be erected as a result of a broad consensus and consultation. So uh, the artist just went there, and I'm talking about the Monument of Humanity, and he built his sculpture or monument there without informing the public. So if you don't include the people, then people will not have ownership on the issue. Just like what happened in Roboski, the trustee would be appointed and then people will not say anything and then the issue is over. So when they were ere ere erecting that monument, they had to include all sections of society. Yes, it's very important. That's also something that uh, really uh, affects me a lot. All the spaces of memory have to be put in place by a broad participation of stakeholders. All the people should come up with their uh, ideas and suggestions and recommendations. And 
I also wish such efforts should not be imposed upon us, but uh, I wish they are done with the participation of all people. One last question, and then we will conclude. As we're talking about uh, Turkey, how do you think the memory work is going on in Turkey? Any inspiring work that you can think of from Turkey? And any, uh, any issue that you think is not tackled by anyone? So, if you were to establish a place of memory or construct a monument, for instance, who would you dedicate it to? Maybe it's a difficult question, but let me ask you, and let's start with you, Hewish. Well, first, I'm sure everyone would love to create their own place of memory according to themselves, the issue that is most dear to their hearts. But in societies like ours, I can say that I have so many things to talk about here because we don't have only uh, one single trauma or violence that we witnessed and faced one after the other we had Roboski you can have a monument for Roboski but then cities were distracted we can have memories places for all those cities but it's not over we still have a lot of ongoing uh, viol uh, violations of rights uh, painful experiences and Trauma is ongoing, so we should uh, try to make sure that these are not forgotten, so that so we need to have monuments to make people remember these things. Then Turkey might turn into a monument, uh, a, a cemetery of memory monuments, let's say, because we have so many things to remember in Turkey, so many pain and sorrow, so much pain and sorrow. So. It started with the 1980 coup d'etat and after the 1980s in the society. Those who were involved in memory work in the society increased in number. We have academics at universities we, uh, that work in this field. We have more archives. Of course, it's thanks to the technology. Uh, now it's easier. And then civil society organizations most recently are doing this, especially until 2015, until the end of the peace process. We had a lot of activities in Turkey on these issues, both from the civil society, the academicians, universities, uh, some scientific research work by academics, for instance. And we also see an increase in the government agencies in many cities, uh, the municipalities are also uh, carrying out city archive initiatives. But it's very difficult recording alternative facts, finding the truth, revealing the truth, going after truth is so difficult that despite all these difficulties, the first thing that comes to my mind, for instance, is Hrantink, a place of memory, 23.5. Uh, it's an example in uh, many dimensions. Again, the memory work of Hafza Merkezi, the memory center, is really important, uh, like a trailblazer. It's very informative for those of us working in the field of memory, and we have the ongoing uh, regional efforts as well, like yours, and we have more smaller scale local initiatives like ours. But we do this because we believe uh, we have to do it. Despite all the challenges, there are civil society organizations that carry out their work, but is this enough? No, we have so many shortcomings. In terms of technology, for instance, we don't know uh, how to do what, we don't have the know-how. But then, I believe that everyone should contribute in a smaller or bigger manner, regardless. And I'm sure in this country, one day, all the small pieces will come together and we will have a chance to talk about these things, hopefully. Unfortunately, I still see, say hopefully, because we don't know. But only then we will be able to create ourselves a new world. Okay, I will uh, wrap up very 
fast. Yes, there are so many diverse efforts and studies, and all of them are very valuable. But as far as I can observe, I can say that our traumatic past has the social dimension, which is not very much focused on. We have the perpetrators in power, and of course, the victim on the other side, and that tension between the two parties has to be relieved and we need to we we have uh, all, most of the work focusing on relieving the tension but i also believe we should put a mirror out there for the society so that the society will look at that mirror and see itself see its ugliness also I hope in time we will have these uh, efforts diversified. And one more thing that I identify as missing in the memory work is the following. Hafza Merkezi two years ago had a wonderful uh, work, but we need to do more. It's very important to keep the archive and also to draw more artists to the political arena. We need to help the artists get organized, just like that world of struggle before the 1980s. We need to make a call to them so that we can continue struggling all together. Well, I don't think I, ha I have much to say after Nevin, but really, if we were to try to draw the memory map of Turkey, we would see that there are so many themes that are missing that we are not working on. There are so many topics that we can work on. And when it's over, just like uh, Marxist historians in UK, we can start discussing those topics. So I mainly work uh, on coup d'etat issues, and I think there is a lot of a lack of work on this area. All people immediately think about the 1980 coup d'etat or the most recent one, but this is true for all the coup d'etat that we have had throughout the history in our country. And just like Eileen has said, witnessing these things and witnessing such traumatic processes And transferring uh, memory between the generations is something that is important to understand. One final thing. I really uh, think the series of uh, the sound, uh, the speak up series by the Granting Foundation is very important uh, because it's an important piece of memory work, not only because it is there, but it also shows us where denial fits in one's life. Yes, even the fact that we are able to gather here today to talk about this topic is uh, very important because as a counter uh, effort, we are able to do this. So I think uh, the work of Hurantink Foundation is very important and the examples given by my colleagues, my fellow panelists are also very good. So during the pandemic, we had the Parasilia Collective established by different Armenian women, women from different places. So I want to talk about this example because I believe that we are concerned about giving a voice to the voiceless and creating a new language. That's important for us, just like the examples you have given. As much as what we remember, how we remember it is important. So it's not about transferring trauma by regenerating it, but we should continue by working together, acting together, thinking together. And it's very important but difficult at the same time. That's why any effort shown in that regard is very important, very valuable, and I'm very happy to be able to be here to talk about these issues today. Thank you. Thank you indeed for listening to us. 
we did not we don't have any uh, more time for questions in the session but we will be around if you want to ask any questions you can find us we would like to thank you all personally for all the work you have carried out on behalf of my institution as well you have very important work that will have transformative uh, power not in the short run maybe that's not the expectation, but in the long run, I really believe that your work makes contribution to social peace. Thank you. We would like to thank everyone for their participation. Before you leave, we will kindly ask you to fill in the evaluation form. You will see the QR code on the screen in a while. Please scan that on your mobile phones and fill in the evaluation form because your thoughts matter for us. Next panel will start at 1 o'clock. If you wish, until 1 o'clock you may visit the booths outside in the terrace and food will also be sold uh, outside for those who want to have lunch.
Welcome to the second session. Talk about inequality in Latin America and Eastern Europe. In a period where the civil space is getting narrow, how NGO people are trying to create new spaces. In the panel, we're going to have the Hungarian Helsinki Committee, um, legal consultants and advocates Zol Sekeres, and the International Network of Civil Liberties member Gaston Chilier. They're going to share their comments. The moderator of the session will be the award winner for uh, Ranting Foundation Award, Murat Chilikikan. Hi. Prominent guests uh, to discuss the situation. One is, as mentioned before, from Hungary. Please, for the sake of everyone, pronounce your name. <laughs> I'm Joet Sekeres. Very nice being here with you. Um, and uh, Gaston uh, is an old friend coming from Argentina, although uh, he, he is the former uh, head of uh, CELS, which is a very important Argentinian institution for, in general, human rights. Uh, but it was established uh, during the dictatorship for uh, defending the rights of uh, the enforced disappeared uh, people. But CELS now also works in uh, all of, I can say, Latin America. And so uh, we have uh, two very experienced and distinguished guests. Uh, let me start by saying that looking at the second half of the uh, 20th century, uh, people would project that the 21st century could be a century of rights or human rights. That did not happen. Uh, now, globally, we're faced uh, with a new phenomenon, which is called the shrinking democratic space or shrinking civic space. Uh, in 20th century, democracies were assassinated with coup d'etats uh, in the hands of dictators. And uh, although uh, human rights and activists and the people under dictatorships suffered a lot, there was always hope for a transition back to democracy. And uh, that happened in most of the countries where coup d'etats happened, including Turkey. Uh, of course, with great uh, cost. But in, in the 21st century, what we are witnessing now is uh, democracy suffocates in the hands of elected leaders which has uh, a popular base among the uh, people and which are elected. So uh, that brings a new tension. Uh, elected leaders, uh, it's very hard nowadays uh, for, let me say, human rights, because there is a contradiction between democracy and the so-called 
election based democracies and human rights. Uh, the first thing uh, these elected leaders, and it's a common phenomena uh, in all of the autocratic regimes, starting with Turkey, Russia, uh, Venezuela, Hungary, Poland, uh, and I can, India, uh, I can add a few more to those, but uh, we see that the leaders learn from each other. That should be a guidebook because uh, <laughs> What they do generally is almost the same. The first thing they do is a uh, uh, sign of uh, authoritarianism is an assault against truth or truth tellers. Because truth seeking is a democratic process in which all of the people with a, f with a so-called freedom of speech can negotiate about uh, what the truth is and come uh, to a common conclusion. But with the shrinking or ending of democratic space, uh, truth-seeking uh, vanishes immediately and instead of truth, uh, the most dominant thing happens to be lies, half-truths, uh, which are dictated uh, by the authoritarian leaders. And because there is no space for the discussion uh, about it, uh, they uh, dominate uh, the truth. Um, and if you think about Turkey, which is another common phenomenon, uh, the first thing those authoritarian leaders do is attack freedom of press, either by censorships or by transfer of ownerships for uh, pro-authoritarian, for, for people, actors who are close uh, to those leaders. Parallel to this, there is an attack on the independence of judiciary. Uh, the judiciary is used uh, as the whip of the uh, leaders uh, to convict, uh, in general, all the opposition. And uh, the most vocal parts of society, of course, are targeted. Journalists, academicians, as you know, that has been the example in Turkey, and then uh, rights defenders uh, and civil society activists. So these are the main targets of uh, most of authoritarian regimes in the world. Uh, here we represent uh, three different, uh, let me say, stages, because according to the Freedom House reports, for civic space and democratic space, Turkey is considered as a closed country which means there is no space for any freedom. Hungary is considered to be half closed and Argentina is considered to be free. So, uh, but of course that does not mean that for a closed country there is no struggle or for a free country there are no obstacles. Um, I would like to start uh, with uh, Gaston and so that he can give us a general view of, about those obstacles or the struggle for human rights in Argentina and in Latin America in general. Thank you, Murat, very much. Uh, it's a, a privilege to be here, and thank you, the Rand Dick, Dick uh, Foundation and Memory Trust, uh, Truth and Justice Center for inviting me uh, for this very important and needed uh, conversations at the festival. Uh, it is good to, to, to hear and to attend and to talk with different people uh, from the world, particularly in Turkey, and to see that there are many challenges for democracy and human rights uh, that we share uh, in this part of the world, uh, 
in Latin America and actually worldwide. Um, and it's very inspiring uh, uh, to, to be part of this discussion and, and very needed, actually. Going back to your question, uh, I know that is in this kind of global discussion is is important to to do comparative analysis and to find similarities between, for example, Turkey and Latin America and Argentina, and actually they are many. But let me start by differences and, and actually to put on the table some kind of more positive uh, trend uh, when we talk about democracy in, in Latin America and in the region. And, and not because there are not challenges as you were telling beyond Freedom House Index that are not necessarily uh, are um, that I share, but uh, I think there are the, the conversation, I would like to highlight some ideas. Uh, you know, in Latin America, particularly South America, we have had over the 20 centuries more authoritarian regimes, like Murat was saying, than democratic regimes. Uh, like authoritarian regimes were the rule. Uh, and in Argentina, uh, the last dictatorship was the most brutal uh, in the region, along with the Chilean one led by, led by Pinochet. Uh, today, for example, Argentina is turning next year 40th anniversary of the democratic regime without interruption. And, and when, I talk, when I say democratic regime is like free and transparent election over the year since 1983, when I was uh, 14 years old. Um, Colombia, two weeks ago, uh, had a presidential election uh, and one leader from, uh, he, he from a, a left-wing party, he, Gustavo Petro, he, he was a former guerrilla member of the movement M19, uh, was elected a president for the first time a left party took power after 70 years of armed conflict. Uh, and actually, the current president and the current government recognized the election, the very same day, it was a second round election, recognized it, and they are uh, working on the transition today. Uh, something that we cannot, talk, we cannot say about the United States, for example, I mean, the northern, uh, democratic champion uh, for the world, uh, as we know. I mean, the, there is still the, the former President Trump and, and tragically, maybe the future is he haven't recognized that he lost the election with the current President Biden. So, uh, in Chile, you know, I mean, this year, uh, um, uh, Boric, the, the current president, took power from coming from a social movement, a student from a social movement uh, from Chile that, they, they, that, that he joined when he was at the, the high school, and they become a political party. Um, and after many governments from center-left and center-right uh, that uh, were kind of quite, uh, uh, mm, they got a consensus, uh, but they didn't uh, address the authoritarian legacy from Pinochet uh, era. Uh, the, this new uh, group uh, won the election. So all of this to say that, uh, of course, uh, there are other, I mean, so that democracy of course, uh, with a lot of problems, I mean, I, I, and the, the main one probably as many, in many countries, but in Latin America is particularly, uh, the most challenging was is inequality. I mean, you know, Latin America is the most unequal region in the world that, uh, and actually the inequality was strengthened by the pandemic, but uh, in, a, in, in spite of many problems, we are 
uh, dealing with the democratic times. Of course, we have other cases. Man. You have, as you mentioned, the case of Venezuela, we have the case of Nicaragua, uh, and, and talking about uh, illiberal democracies, we have the most, uh, I mean, I will say the most because the, the scale and the relevant, the importance of the country, uh, the most important case that is the case of Brazil, in which Bolsonaro uh, is a former military uh, a member and is uh, uh, completely undemocratic. He has uh, un undo. He destroyed the the, the, mo the the good policies in favor, social policies in favor of indigenous people, Afro-Brazilian people, uh, social policies, uh, and actually there are elections in Brazil in October, and hopefully uh, he will be unseat. And, and a final example, just to finish, about in some way a, a positive step was we had uh, in the region a coup d'etat in Bolivia in two, 2019 uh, against uh, Evo Morales that actually he tried to overstay in power but uh, that was something illegal, something undemocratic, but uh, actually he was a victim of a coup d'etat from, a, like a traditional coup d'etat uh, from the military. But uh, after less than a year, there were free elections and his government, uh, not himself, was back in power at uh, the president, Anin Janies, Janies uh, who perpetrated with the military the coup d'etat was convicted because uh, she led this coup d'etat. And this is something that I think are positive signs. I am not saying that we are in a beautiful position. There are huge and many problems, and we share a lot of problems, but I just wanted to start by some positive signs from Latin America, and then we can talk specifically about human rights and, for example, uh, abortion and sexual reproductive rights in Latin America. That is something positive. Thank you, Gaston. Um, of course, in general, when we look at the world, uh, Latin America uh, gives us hope, let me say, uh, because there are more positive things uh, we can name and see uh, in Latin America. But uh, let's come back to Europe now. <laughs> uh, although... Uh, I mean, in your country, uh, one of the authoritarian leaders, Orban, is elected again. So he will remain in power. Uh, and what are the obstacles and what is the situation of your uh, precious work uh, in uh, Hungary? Well, thank you also for um, inviting me. Thank you for the organizers for having us um, address this panel and um, be here and be able to exchange ideas and be inspired by the uh, human rights work that many of you do here in here in Turkey. It's a source of inspiration for us in Hungary too. And the Hungarian Helsinki Committee is um, one of the oldest and largest human rights organizations in the country. It was set up um, during the end of communism to help oversee the transition into democracy in 1989. And the main focus or the main aim of the Hungarian Helsinki Committee has been to, ever since its foundation over 30 years ago, to protect uh, the rights of asylum seekers and refugees, which of course was fundamental during the Yugoslavian wars, uh, which is south of Hungary, and uh, the rights of prisoners and detained people and uh, victims of police brutality and police violence. And there was maybe this era of optimism, I think, in the 90s and early 2000s um, that, you know, communism fell, democracy is here, Hungary joined the European Union, and everything's going to be fine. But everything was not fine uh, at the end. And it also made uh, Helsinki think about how to reorient uh, its work after 2010 when the current uh, governing party, Fidesz, led by Prime Minister Viktor Orban to power, and it was increasingly clear that they are um, 
detaching themselves from the conventional rules of uh, constitutional democracy and the rule of law in favor of the raw power of majority. And there have been these signs of um, a country sliding away from democracy and back into a more authoritarian rule, uh, happening, of course, step by step, so that it's not that um, easy to, uh, to notice at first. There have been uh, newly appointed judges to the Constitutional Court, for example, which over time has become a lot more reluctant to rule against the government, strike down laws which are blatantly unconstitutional because they violate the rights of minorities, for example, but are dear to the government. Um, there have been new laws passed uh, to silence the opposition. There have been hostile takeovers uh, in media to silence opposition or independent-leaning newspapers um, to rearrange the ownership system. And it's quite clear that, um, I mean, Viktor Orban stated himself in 2014, uh, he traditionally goes to a, a summer festival for uh, for conservative youth, where he delivers a big speech about his vision for the next years to come. And in 2014, he openly said that he is building an illiberal state, which, is, which still believes in freedom and such, as he put it, uh, but it has a national character, and in such it is not a liberal one, but an illiberal one. And he himself said that there are opponents to his vision, uh, which are civil society organizations who are funded by, quote unquote, we don't know who, so we have to make sure that they are more transparent. Now, of course, civil society has been transparent um, ever since uh, the fall of communism. There are strict uh, criteria on the reporting of our finances, income, staffing. Um, we are overseen, our functioning is overseen by the independent judiciary, as, as it should be. But there started this uh, fear-mongering in Hungarian society that there is an outside influence by unelected civil society workers who cite civil rights and the rights and freedoms of people who are not very popular in society, refugees, LGBT people, women, uh, detainees, uh, people in prison, and we have to look into them because they're actually political activists. That's what the uh, Prime Minister claimed, claims since then, and I'm sure that these lines uh, sound familiar to many sitting in this room or listening in online since these are lines that are echoed by many other authoritarian leaning uh, leaders. So the work that we do has been becoming increasingly tough, but um, actually we uh, we're not really faced with a choice in the sense that protecting human rights is, is, is what we do. And the Hungarian Helsinki Committee, together with our NGO partners, um, had to rethink a lot of the work that we do and how we do it, especially when uh, the state authorities completely cut contact with us. We had long-standing uh, cooperation agreements which allowed us to enter detention facilities, provide legal aid um, and, um, and legal advice representation for victims of rights violations in prisons, immigration detention facilities, asylum detention facilities. So it made us very hard to access the people that we set out to help. New laws were put in place to repel and deter asylum seekers, of course, after 2015. And um, the Hungarian Helsinki Committee was put at the forefront of the government fear-mongering and hate-mongering campaign, portraying us as wanting to bring in illegal migrants. Um, this brought us into a very negative spotlight on the one hand. On the other hand, it gave us a lot of opportunity to talk about the work that we actually do. And it gave us a lot of opportunity to make use of the international recognition that we received, uh, well, thanks to our, the government, but most importantly, uh, due to our, our work to still work for the fundamental rights of the people who need our help, because nobody else would help them if we wouldn't. And in this, I mean, we're going to talk about this more in detail, but I would just really like to emphasize the importance of reaching out to others and building alliances, because, of course, uh, when one group in society is singled out, uh, in this case it was NGOs and civil society actors, uh, others will 
follow, of course, and this way we become each other's natural allies. So it would be a huge wasted opportunity and in fact uh, another blow for democracy if we didn't reach out to another. Thank you. Um, I would like to ask both of you, I mean, let's, although our principles are the same, defending human rights, uh, since the world has changed totally, because we have leaders, political leaders, uh, who directly uh, attacks human rights, denounces that this is women's rights, LGBT rights, let's say, which are fundamental rights in human rights, are not acceptable. So there is a direct attack. Uh, should we change or think about changing how we work, how we deal with human rights? Is international and national solidarity uh, has an impact on the work we do? Is it important, more important than it used to be? And uh, should we change the way we deal with politics in, in the sense that uh, of course, the human rights organizations have their own policies and what they do is political, but they are neutral. I mean, uh, in, in, in uh, governmental or uh, country politics, uh, <clears throat> they only emphasize uh, the values, but they do not point out uh, any political party being, should this change? Um, I think that this is the question <laughs> about this conversation and many conversations that are going around at the global south but also at the global north uh, about our strategy, strategies. Um, and particularly, I think it's, it's quite important to rethink about the, not the concept, but uh, the strategy of international solidarity and, and, and actually uh, rediscuss it because uh, if we have in consideration the examples that, I mean, you have mentioned, I mean, we can also mention many others, I mean, Turkey, Hungary, uh, um, India, Venezuela, Russia, uh, and many others, Brazil. Uh, the, the old strategies that the human rights movement used to, to work with, the old uh, toolbox seems that are not working well. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, I, I, I am coming from Argentina, um, from an organization was founded at the middle of the dictatorship by relatives um, of victims for the dictatorship from disappearance uh, to support the work that mothers and grandmothers of Plaza de Mayo were doing at touch time. Um, and actually, as always said, the, the concept of shrinking, shrinking civic spaces didn't exist at Dutch time. There wasn't any space at all. We were in the middle of the most brutal dictatorship. Uh, of course, democratic institutions were not working at all. Free press, and judiciary, elections, unions. And I know, probably you know the number, I mean, the, there are the, like 30,000 disappearances, disappearances from Dutch time. So the, the, the, there was a brutal dictatorship. And of course, uh, there were not uh, social networks. Uh, uh, uh, um, internet didn't exist. Hardly the way we have analogic telephones. Um, and mothers and grandmothers had this very simple idea to go around Plaza de Mayo with a hand, how do you say handkerchief? Uh, uh, yeah. English translation? The, the, the white uh, handkerchief handkerchief, I, uh, scarf, thank you. Um, and that was a kind of very simple 
strategy that uh, uh, was a basic of the international uh, campaign against dictatorship uh, that become worldwide uh, known and very powerful. Uh, of course, we are living in a very different world now, and geopolitically speaking, uh, I mean, it's nothing to do with that. And as you have said at the introductory, introductory remarks, now these authoritarian regimes are kind of weird because they got to the power by elections, uh, and, and actually, I mean, for me, and I, of course I don't have answers because I wouldn't be here, because I would be in another place if I have the answer. Uh, I, I, the, the, the, the main issue is how in this geopolitical scenario uh, we can do uh, effective international campaigns in order to uh, denounce, to name and shame, uh, and to create changes in national realities. So this is one question that I, I think I have and I still are going around, and I think this is a part of the discussion that we all have, we have to do. The second uh, is, I think, part of this previous era in which human rights were relevant in order to do an international campaign was, uh, yeah, we were living in the framework left by the Second World War in which international human rights uh, were part of the, that uh, uh, um, part, of, part of the Second World War uh, uh, end, and, and the human rights started from the international and from the international, the Universal Human Rights Declaration and so on, the regional bodies, the regional uh, treaties from the international went to the national realities and, and, and the legitimacy came from, from, the, from the summit of the governmental power after the war. Uh, actually, I think over the last 70 years, I mean, for different reasons that it's not to discuss here, or, or it is to discuss here, that legitimacy has exhausted. <laughs> and, and, and there is no like a power uh, using these instrument at the international level that are effective. So, one of the, the ideas that are going around, uh, if, we, if we need, because of course we still believe on the human rights values <laughs> that are part of these instruments and part of this international architecture, we will have to rebuild the legitimacy from national to international and not in the other way around as was before. And that's connect with two other different, two other things. One is uh, the one that you mentioned, I mean, the relationship between the movement, I mean, the human rights movement with politics. Uh, and I think, I, I really think that uh, we, we become too much professional, technocratical, and expert to say a word that is a lot of use. And, and we become very much actors to talk to the power and to the palace. Palace means uh, government, I mean judiciary, parliament. And we have detached from the streets, from, from the people, if you want. And in some way, uh, we, we lost track with what were the real problems because we were too busy uh, trying to do advocacy on policies, uh, but not actually trying to win elections because we are not <laughs> part of it. Uh, and so I am not talking about part in a partisan way, but I think we have to rethink about this idea of no, you know, we, we, don't, we don't do politics. I mean, you know, uh, we are independent, transparent, autonomous. We, we don't get involved uh, in these kind of shit activities, in, in these kind of dirty activities, because we are pure uh, and, and, and, you know, we just have these values 
and we work with this. And the second issue connected with this, I think, is relationship with social movement. I've been in the previous panel about the grassroots activism uh, that was very interesting, uh, and I think uh, we as a human rights movement called civil society, called non-governmental organizations or, or support organization or whatever we want to call it, uh, we have to find another place in order to connect the street with the palace <laughs> and vice versa. I mean, to bring it um, back and forth uh, and to use our expertise uh, and to use our knowledge in order to translate uh, demands or, or not to translate because I think it's, it's, a, it's a tricky word, but in order to work with, in alliance with uh, different groups. Uh, and I, to, I mean, the main point I am trying to make is to build other type of power that is in the street and not necessarily to influence the mainstream power, the institutional power. And I think to build another type of power instead of to influence and to advocate the palace, I think we have to rethink many things about our strategies. Thank you. I'm going to ask the same question to you, but uh, let me put some additional points in that because uh, with the wars and with the climate crisis, uh, most probably uh, our future, main, one of the main agendas of human rights will be refugees, uh, unavoidably. Uh, and with the inequality going on, the other one, uh, the global issue point is poverty. So uh, you are an organization working for refugee rights also. And it's very hard when uh, your leaders and uh, your population uh, has a discourse of uh, pointing out the refugees as uh, the cause of all the problems uh, in the country. So, uh, do you have a toolbox to deal with this? Uh, did you change your strategies? How are you dealing with it? Yes, um, working with refugees has always been uh, challenging ever since 2015 when, of course, Europe was faced with what many people call the refugee crisis. I personally don't like this term. I think it was more humanitarian and rule of law crisis, if anything. The crisis was not that they're refugees. The crisis was how Europe and the European Union dealt with those refugees many times. Uh, and before I go on to, to answer the refugee-related questions, just a few points on how to reframe the general human rights discourse and, and whether we should you know, rethink our position to politics because civil rights work is political. I mean, it is quite clear. And what we have also ha come to learn the hard way that, um, that if we remain to just, if we, if we remain solely on the track of being the experts and the pure ones, it's not going to resonate uh, with the people that the populists uh, claim to, to get the legitimacy from. And it is true that, of course, um, nobody can, uh, nobody argues that, for example, the last election in April, the current governing party won. However, if you look at the lies and the changing of the electoral law, the, the fairness of this election can be um, debated, uh, to say the least. And when we are faced with a changing civic space around us that focuses on, on, on emotional-based discussions, it's very hard to remain in the role of the neutral expert because nobody will really want to listen to what you have to say. However, we have to keep doing the work that we do, which is to remain in the professional, high professional level of work that we do and bring cases to court, represent people, but translate it better and explain it better to the public, uh, to the people that we help oftentimes. That why do we do it and why is it good for them uh, if we do it, if we hold the government accountable? Why does it help everybody if you represent asylum seekers who have been uh, deprived of their liberty in a manner which is not uh, 
which is, which is against the law. Why do we help the refugees and not help, quote unquote, those who suffered because they were left behind by the economic uh, process and the economic situation that Hungary faced? Um, we have to reinvent this, this communication strategy a lot better and just instead of always uh, complaining or always holding the power accountable, we have to become a positive actor and explain our position, explain the value of human rights work, I think a lot better to those who are actually in need of the human rights work that we do, but at the same time can fall victim very easily to the populist regimes who prey on their fear, who prey on their vulnerability, and instead of enable them, they push them deeper and they also are a lot in need of the protection that the human rights work can give to them. And to the question of refugees, well, after 2015, uh, a lot changed. And before 2015, working refugees was seen as um, like a nice thing, you know? I mean, you work with people who were persecuted and it's um, challenging, but it's a good thing that you do. But after 2015, when the government also changed course and started this incredibly intense hate mongering campaigns uh, saying that uh, Syrian and Afghan refugees coming to Hungary are going to steal people's jobs and they bring uh, a culture that doesn't belong here and they are somehow threatening and they're all these single men who come to do unspeakable things with the women and all of a sudden everybody was a women's rights champion who previously wasn't. Um, so that's, that really changed um, the discourse and we had a hard time explaining initially why you know, do we do this thing that uh, many claim to be a national security issue as opposed to a human rights issue. And of course there are national security elements in working with refugees, nobody in their right mind I think can, uh, can question that. But uh, we, we resorted to, to very simple storytelling. And there were a lot of human rights violations with very similar faces to the wider public. For example, the Hungarian government built so-called transit zones on the Serbian border, which were places of detention, where if uh, after a very unjust, undue procedure which completely lacked any kind of fairness, they rejected somebody and could not deport them because for some reason Syria or Afghanistan was not very quick to take them back in a, um, in a formal procedure, they would stop giving them food. These people, refugees, were mothers, fathers, children, they were locked into a place and starved by a European Union government. And of course we we litigated, we turned to the European Court of Human Rights, uh, which ordered that they should be given food very fast, and we told this story to the public that your government is starving people. And that resonated very well, because even people who supported the government would never stand for such brutality. And after 30 such cases, which we always made a huge fuss about, this stopped. And now with the Ukrainian uh, war, or the war of Russia in Ukraine, it's uh, what we see is that there is um, a double standard from the side of the government that of course Hungary is a neighboring country to Ukraine and uh, I think now it's over or nearly 1.5 million people who came to Hungary. They didn't all stay in Hungary, um, many left, but um, Hungary cannot not open its doors and welcome them. And then they have a hard time explaining, you know, why do we help the Ukrainians and not help the Afghans? Why does the law say that if an Afghan refugee is found, or any refugee other than Ukrainian, found in the territory of Hungary, they cannot, the law says that they cannot ask for asylum, they're thrown out of, to Serbia, literally to the Serbian fields and forests, uh, often beaten, while at another border, people fleeing from the same war, type of war and violence, they, they are let in, as they should be. Uh, and there, the, there are answers, of course, to this. Um, of course, many of them are inherently racist, but uh, the official answer is that they are coming directly from a war, so they are somehow more deserving of the help that we can get. But then again, 
there are those fleeing from Ukraine who somehow don't get the help that uh, allegedly everybody gets. For example, the Roma population fleeing Ukraine face a uh, very high level of, of discrimination in Hungary. But I, I, we still have hope um, for the work that we do, and that's because of the initial response of the Hungarian society, which really moved very fast when Russia attacked Ukraine, and many people opened their homes and houses to the refugees, which was a good sign that that um, that uh, solidarity could not be killed out of Hungarian society, despite the best efforts of the government. And it also presented us with the possibility to explain that why the previous laws depriving the rights of refugees are bad. Because the stories that the Ukrainian refugees now say are very, very similar oftentimes to the stories that refugees in general say. Why did they cross uh, on the green border? Why didn't they use the border crossing points? Why don't they have documentation? Why don't they stay at home and fight? You know, And these questions come up and now it's more relatable for the Hungarian public to understand that the questions to these answer, the, the answers to these questions are, are extremely humane. And nobody in their right mind, I think, would leave their children behind to catch bullets from, from the Russian tanks. They would flee, and that's what the Hungarians would also do. That's what many of them did after 1956. So um, it presents uh, um, uh, a huge challenge, of course, for our refugee work, but also as an opportunity to, to explain to the Hungarian public that when people flee and leave their homes, this is what it looks like. No matter if they're white or black, or if they're Christian or Muslim, when people flee, that's what happens, and that's why we have to protect them, and we have not just the, the legal obligation, but the moral uh, obligation to grant them with protection. So, uh, just wanted uh, to, to say something about your previous question, because I think it's very relevant about the relationship between politics and human rights and our strategies, and I, I want to highlight the example of Colombia and the, the, the new president, actually the vice president that was elected, uh, her name is Francia Martinez, probably you read about her because become very well known. And, and she is an Afro-Colombian person from working from the Pacific communities, Afro-Colombian communities, and she is a housemaid, single mother of three kids, and a feminist and environmental uh, activist. And she decided to participate in the primaries in this big coalition, and actually uh, the elected president Petro, in some way, had to choose her <laughs> as, a, as a vice president candidate, uh, because, uh, and her role there, and her mobilization at the grassroots level was uh, critical in order to win. And so she was a, uh, she is a person from grassroots uh, movement, and she has a feminist and environmental justice agenda, and she's now the vice president, first Afro-Colombian woman by president in the history of Colombia. Okay, uh, it's obvious that uh, although uh, the world is changing, uh, um, human rights will be a constant need. And there is more need for human rights activism uh, nowadays under uh, authoritarian regimes, most probably, on the one hand, with the world crisis of poverty and refugees and environmental uh, change and crisis uh, too. Uh, although although uh, we are resilient and working uh, still, uh, it's obvious that some discussions about the human rights movement in this new era is essential uh, because the attack in general and the problems are international. The language of human rights is international, but the organizations are not. 
So there is a challenge uh, in this issue. So if you want to comment on it, um, how can we reach out and have uh, international support uh, or uh, internationalize our local issues? Do you have? <laughs> I think it's very, very important, and I will be very brief about it, that um, in the Hungarian context, at least, it's uh, harder for the government to to get away with uh, with new legislation or practices that um, that that violate human rights if if they're silenced about it. I think, although it is a new strategy of the populist leaders that they completely detach themselves from our previous understanding of self-restraint and shame and democratic norms, still if there is um, considerable public and political pressure that it would cost them too much to do something that would violate human rights, we can get them to back off. There is a very good um, example for this when the Hungarian uh, governing majority intended to introduce a new system of administrative courts uh, which, uh, into which the administrative uh, litigious um, procedures would be channeled into. There was a lot of uh, international and European Union uproar, uh, also from the participants of the private sector, the investors and the business uh, actors who understood that if their investment cases and if their um, um, arguments about land use and land buy and, and, uh, and labor rights cases would go into courts which are controlled by the government, then their fair procedure can be called into question. And then that also helped a lot, of course, heavily supported by the more core human rights arguments to get the Hungarian government that controlled over two thirds of the parliament and really with no effective opposition to back off and not do it. Of course, they're still hacking, um, which is a soft word, they're attempting to take over uh, the, uh, the, um, the judiciary, but this is a very important victory for the uh, wider human rights coalition. And of course, in the context of the European Union, it's extremely important to always um, remind the European Commission and the Parliament that they have a job to maintain, uh, to uphold the treaties of the EU, which are, as we heard yesterday, founded on the principles of democracy and human rights and human dignity. And slowly, because it's a slow mechanism, but um, it brings results. Um, so far, Hungary is the only country uh, in the European Union which did not receive the uh, recovery funds uh, after COVID because there are systemic problems, uh, not just with human rights, but with corruption. And, uh, and this, all, of course, is under the umbrella of the state capture uh, that occurred in the past 12 years. So advocacy uh, really helps and it can bring about tangible results and can force even the hand of the most determined authoritarian not to do something or retreat from something. Um, yes, I, I think that that this is, yes, as we were saying before, is a critical issue how if we have to relegitimize international human rights framework and architecture because the values, I mean, still are needed and we believe in them, this process will be from, from national or local to international. So the question that you, Murat, asked is, is, is important. And as, as you said, they are already, they, I mean, the authoritarian leaders, uh, I already playing with the, the, the book, I mean, and those, I mean, Orbans, Bolsonaro, Erdogan, Modi, they already have the guy book, and I think uh, we are still drafting it. We have to hurry up. <laughs> but, uh, but I think there are, I, I can think in, a, in a one uh, a good, interesting example of how international, local, and national issues that is from Latin America and from Argentina, that is the, the movement, the feminist movement around the issue of abortion. 
uh, and you know, uh, after 20 years of uh, mobilization of uh, feminist movements with plural in Argentina, uh, in 2020, the, the Congress uh, passed uh, the law uh, adopting the abortion for women after the three months, I mean, up to three months. And, and actually, I mean, for a country uh, which, uh, um, for a country with Catholic and who, who the Pope is Argentinian, you know, I mean, it <laughs> was unthinkable to, to, to have the abortion law adopted. And the, this movement uh, and the, the feminist movement using the handkerchief, the bandana, the green bandana become uh, global and regional. And after Argentina, actually, Chile passed, passed um, and, and Colombia and Mexico and Uruguay uh, adopted similar legislation uh, about uh, sexual and reproductive rights. Uh, and actually, I, yesterday I, I read uh, an article in Foreign Affairs that uh, was writing after the, Supreme, the US Supreme Court decision in Roe versus Wade, uh, rejecting, I mean, actually ending like uh, an era on abortion uh, and rights for for people and women and other uh, in in the U.S. The article was what can be what it was a very interesting because from a U.S. perspective, I think is something extremely unlikely. What we can learn from from Latin America, not the, the, I mean, from coming from the United States, they they are thinking. An example uh, that uh, uh, can be learned from Latin America, and actually this was a very local issue in Argentina for 20 years, uh, with a very different uh, strategies and tactics, political, mobilization, legal, uh, litigation, national and international, that at the end, after many failures, <laughs> uh, they, they succeed. And, and not only that, but they, they re, they, the, the, the issue was replicated in other countries in Latin America and become, uh, uh, actually yesterday in another session there was a picture of these green uh, bandanas. And so I think this is, this is a, a good example. And, and one of the issues in terms of activism that I think is very important and was very important, or was important here, but I think it should be, think, uh, more strategically is the connection and articulation between movement, because the feminist movement also was articulated the human rights movement in Argentina, and with incipiently young environmental justice movement as well, in order to uh, mobilize uh, to approve the abortion law. So I think that uh, this is something, the youth movement about climate justice, there are, Ma many things that you, as we as a human rights movement, we have to reach out, as Josie was saying before, other movements in order to articulate, because they are doing so. I mean, the, the anti-right, the racism uh, guys, uh, the corporation sector, uh, the white supremacists are speaking together with like three basic ideas. <laughs> And, and we are still working in asylum, and I think this is something that uh, urgently we have to change. Her ikisi de yurt dışından ve uzaktan geldiği için bir saati onları dinlemek üzere kullandım. Sorularınız varsa çıkışta ve fuayede. Uh, I thank Maria. Time during the festival in, in Istanbul. Thank you.
hem günün hem de festivalin bu salondaki son otur. Welcome to the very final panel session of the day and also the conference. At this panel, uh, we will discuss the question, why is the struggle against climate crisis a human rights issue and why it is at stake and which other rights are affected? So we will be evaluating uh, this uh, together with a number of, uh, uh, number of experts uh, with Özlem Altıparmak, who is a member of Nature Association, and also from the Climate Network uh, journalist, the coordinator, uh, Nurbanu Kocaslan Semerci, and last but not least, uh, the founders of Wallstadt Asphalt uh, from Germany, climate activist, author, and journalist, uh, Clara Thompson. Uh, will tell us why climate crisis is not a priority issue for the government. And this session will be moderated by uh, an expert from Heinrich Stiftung uh, who works on energy de demo democracy and geopolitical importance of energy resources, Julia Bartman. Welcome from my side, Hoş geldiniz. Um, yeah, I'm very glad on behalf of Heinrich Böhr Foundation to welcome you today to our talk um, to discuss the climate crisis and its connection to human rights. Um, yeah, with, um, without urgent action, the world will soon exceed the goal government set in the 2015 Paris Agreement of um, limiting global warming to 1.5 um, Celsius degree above pre-industrial levels or well below two degrees. Um, the rise in the average global temperature to date has already severe effects that we also have um, observed all around the world and especially also in Turkey now um, with water droughts and um, fires that spread quite more widely because of the drought, um, mucilage and many different other uh, um, natural catastrophes that are directly linked to the climate crisis. And um, yeah, even though um, experts are constantly um, warning that we cannot exceed the 1.5 degree level because then um, our livelihood and our future on this planet will be threatened, so far political action, even though it should be urgent, has been very slow. Um, why is the climate crisis a human rights crisis? Um, the climate... You might. You might. Okay, is this working now? Now I feel like on a spaceship with so much <laughs> technique around me, but okay. Um, yeah, so why is, why is the climate crisis a, a human rights crisis? Um, it's endangering the future on, on this planet. Um, it's endangering how, if we can live on this planet. And um, one very important aspect is that the climate crisis is man-made. It's human-made. We are, we are pushing, we human beings are pushing this, this planet to the limit by exploiting it um, intensely. So also not not um, acting now urgently on the climate crisis is a political decision and um, that's also enforcing um, this issue because states have the, obli have the obligation to um, protect their citizens, um, to make sure they have the right to live, they have the right to water, they have the right to food, they have the right to environment, all these fundamental rights that we need um, to have a livable life on this planet are directly um, connected how states are acting. So now politics not acting is kind of a direct, yeah, it's a direct violation of human rights. So I'm here now um, with experts on these topics and we want to discuss a different, different dimension, different approach 
that we have because um, the global crisis, it's um, a global crisis, but still we are, our state world system is functioning in, in, in regional um, uh, politics. So it's kind of, it's a global crisis, but still, um, even though we have the Paris Agreement, um, climate action is mainly based on national level. But we want to today discuss why this is kind of not enough and how this maybe also might threaten um, yeah, needed urgent action. And um, so um, we want now to take a look because um, we have very different, different um, awareness about this climate crisis, even though it's so, so urgent that we react. It's, for example, in Turkey, I would say, in the public discourse, not even so well, well known. And in, that, in other different parts, we will hear a perspective from Germany where especially the youth movement has been very, very active and very um, successful in pushing, pushing awareness about the climate crisis um, on, the, on the agenda, in the public discourse, but also in, in national politics. In Turkey, the situation is at the moment a bit different. And um, therefore, I'm very glad that um, we have Nurbano here as an expert following all these developments. And um, yeah, I wanted um, yeah, to ask you, how, what do you think is one of the main reasons that even though we are observing the fires, we are observing musilage, we are observing the droughts in the, in the north here in Turkey, how does it come that it's um, not not so deeply, like why is there no public outcry? Why is no, there no public protest? Um, why is it not so seen in, in, in the public discourse, in media? Um, I think there's always like an immediate reaction, but then it kind of flows the moment the crisis is kind of, the crisis we see like the fires is gone. So um, why do you think it's not of high, high interest in the broader public in Turkey and, um, also because um, not acting, as I already said, is a political decision. What, what are we observing here in Turkey from the political side? What are um, the excuses not to act immediately? Uh, first of all, let me thank you for this question. Uh, let us uh, address this issue from the perspective of media. Why is it so that a climate crisis is not widely covered in the media or why we still have low awareness on climate crisis? So I would like to first elaborate on that. Uh, as uh, you are all aware, the most uh, burning question for Turkey as of today is uh, the issue of economy. I mean, if we ask people uh, about the most pressing problem for them uh, as of today, uh, they would respond uh, that it would be economy. And when we discuss this issue uh, with uh, Mark Hardstats from uh, covering climate network uh, as well as other climate journalists or experts, By the way, he heard this from another Turkish colleague when he was the Turkey back then. People uh, still think of uh, if they will have a meal or not at their, at their dinner table every day. Uh, so this being the case, uh, they uh, are not truly concerned with the climate crisis or other issues that will be important for their lives or affect their lives in the future. So economy affects us uh, on a daily basis. And this is also uh, widely covered in the media as opposed to climate crisis. But of course, we still need media to cover the climate crisis or emergency. But here we need to talk about the uh, structural problems uh, of media outlets, uh, the uh, media tycoons, ownership structure, does not allow us to raise uh, to the real issues that we have. Most of the media outlet owners, due to political reasons, 
and upon the imposition of uh, governments, uh, they had to uh, change hands. In other words, uh, the media ownership was uh, transformed from their previous owners to the uh, government imposed new owners. And by the way, one cannot really uh, make, make profit uh, out of uh, journalism or, or media business. So most of the media companies uh, owning these media outlets, they have, for instance, energy investments. Some of them are active in energy uh, transmission or geothermal power plants or even oil uh, refineries. Given that, who should have the ultimate responsibility uh, of the climate crisis? This is a key question, but unfortunately, the current structural uh, problems in the media sector uh, does not allow us uh, to see this in media and investigate the causal link. And what I mean by causal link is what you have already mentioned. I mean, we have the global target to uh, limit uh, the uh, global uh, warming or increase in temperature uh, to 1.5 uh, Celsius uh, or keep it at least uh, at uh, 2 Celsius uh, degrees in certain sectors. But how can we achieve that target? Of course, we need to, uh, we cannot go as business as usual. We need to uh, completely uh, leave uh, away the uh, fossil fuel uh, sector, um, we should definitely uh, stop using any coal or other fossil fuels in our daily lives. Uh, Endüstrilerin içinde olduğu müddetçe haliyle onların çalışanları, gazeteciler de çok iyi anlamda bu olanlara yönelemiyorlar. İkincisi de Türkiye'de evet büyük ana akım medya. Also secondly in Turkey there is um, a serious um, dependence on advertising uh, revenue. Um, that's the current model and there are different company models in Turkey and when I say advertising models I mean um, you know income that is um, coming from fossil fuel industry so this is a matter of interests mutual interests and the media system in Turkey has changed dr dramatically in Turkey and we see the emergence of a new in independent uh, media and And uh, many of these media outlets are actually funded by um, their um, um, viewers or their readers. Uh, and I'm one of, um, I come from such a media outlet myself. But here's the problem in these um, areas. There is a lack of specialization. So uh, there are very small news uh, rooms. And yes, people are well-intentioned and journalists are well-intentioned. But one journalist cannot cover 20 different areas. That's the case in Turkey. And they need to do this on a day-to-day -day basis. They need to focus on politics and environment. And at the same time, they need to cover sports events and, you know, politics, women issues uh, this and that so it's a very wide range and uh, you don't have a lot of specialization in Turkey unfortunately and when it comes to the climate obviously this is a huge chapter when a journalist uh, reads something about COP or the Paris Agreement um, you know all these um, important events they can only give the gist of uh, what happened, and sometimes they even fall short of doing that. You talked about wildfires, and on the one hand, yes, um, within the media system, actually, um, l last summer, actually, we had a series of very um, grave uh, wildfires, and um, the media and also certain segments of the society, uh, certain segments of the society turned a blind eye to these wildfires or depending on our political persuasions we made sense of these wildfires um, in a certain way or another and uh, Konda um, a poster they a Turkish poster they do um, they carry out a survey every year on um, awareness about climate and climate crisis and here's what we see when we look at the results of that survey last um, um, you know, a, a, a big portion of the society, 75%, they're aware of the climate crisis, they're concerned about it, 
and uh, they know that it's uh, man-made and um, you know that th this conviction is um, increasing day by day because in our day-to-day -day lives we actually see and experience the implications of climate crisis but causal links when it comes to causal links um, you know if it's man-made what causes climate um, crisis the answer to that question is not so apparent um, when you look at the society and when you look at journalists as well there's a lack of awareness uh, for instance when it comes to wildfires more conservative people think uh, or left right-wing um, right-leaning people believe that uh, you know these were actually perpetrated by uh, terrorists uh, started by terrorists and uh, left-leaning people uh, thought that these wildfires were caused by rampant um, zoning of, of um, forest areas. Um, that's what people um, thought. But when it comes to the climate crisis, um, whether climate crisis played a role in wildfires or not, um, you know, we see that there isn't a lot of awareness about that. So all in all, um, just to wrap up, I could say that Yes, we need to raise awareness when it comes to these issues um, in the society. And media plays a very important role as well. And yes, we're all bound by our ideologies, both as individuals and as journalists. We carry a, an ideological luggage that needs to be taken into account. And large swathes of the Turkish public are averse, have this aversion to news. I mean, we have this uh, aversion to receiving news and reading news. Reuters had a survey, and uh, the survey tells us that why. Because, you know, n you know, news, when you read the news, it's full of bad news, and we're subjected to... Um, uh, awful news such as, you know, catastrophes and floods, sea snot um, in the west of the Black Sea region. We had all floods and many people lost their lives um, and we had infrastructure problems in the region as well. And we had wildfires as well. And, and uh, not just in Turkey, but in Greece as well, in Spain, in other med Mediterranean countries, we had these wildfires and also in the media when you read these uh, news uh, you try to um, in order to protect yourself you uh, try to avoid these news because because at the end of the day um, you don't want to be demoralized but on the other hand in the media you still see that uh, uh, we, we don't really see enough coverage about the climate change, what um, the solution could be. Uh, unfortunately, uh, there's a lack of coverage and, and a lack of understanding in Turkey. So we have a long way to go, I think, in this regard. And um, this also has an impact on policymakers and the society at large. But um, th there are some good signs as well. So that's how I would like to um, finish off. Thank you very much. Um, Clara, coming to you, um, we just heard now that um, here uh, in Turkey, like the, the media awareness, um, yeah, media itself is tackling um, different crises. Also, like Turkey itself is uh, not only affected at the moment by the climate crisis, but also by economic crisis. So here it's not so much in the public discourse. In Germany now, it's quite different. And um, yeah, this is thanks to the very active climate movement, also like the young climate movement. Um, they managed in the last years um, not only to change the public discourse, um, but also politics. So, um, yeah, we had uh, parliamentary elections last autumn, and I think like um, nearly every party stated um, that fighting the climate crisis is one of, one of their um, priority goals. And... Um, Shortly before, like half a year before the for, before the elections happened, um, the climate movement had another huge success because um, they went for the Germ German Federal Constitutional Court, and um, the court had published a groundbreaking judgment that the governments from the old government, the government's climate law, is partially unconstitutional. No, and um, this uh, judgment followed the complaint brought by these young activists. Um, that the law will not um, limit uh, the effects of the climate crisis enough and therefore violates their fundamental right to a human future. And um, this, yeah, I mean, it's a groundbreaking judgment. Could you maybe um, briefly just sketch for us um, 
how, how the climate movement got so successful in changing the discourse and how they then also managed to cement their goal like legally in a legal system. Thank you. Thank you for this question. First of all, I would like to say how excited I am to be here. It's my first time in Istanbul and I think like talking about the topic of climate change, so important that we have these spaces where we can talk about this together, especially because flying is also a topic, but it, like in the climate movement, but it makes it difficult to connect with people. So I'm really grateful that we're having this opportunity. So maybe to answer that question, um, I can start out a bit with my own story maybe because I wasn't always a climate activist and I don't know, maybe a lot of, some of you are, some of you aren't, but for me, I only realized about three years ago, um, I just finished uh, like high school and I was like, what, what are we doing? Like back then, um, in Germany at least, the topic of climate change, it was not a topic at all. And I had this feeling, and a lot of my friends had this feeling, and we were like, the climate crisis is happening, but this, it's in such a big contrast with what the governments are doing, and they're not doing enough. So that was 2018, and that was also the year that Greta Thunberg, I guess a lot of people um, know her, started the school strikes. And for m my friends and me, that was so much, we were like, oh my God, this is what we need right now, we're gonna join this. So that's when I got into the climate movement. And I never like considered myself an activist, but I just felt like this was so important to do. And in Germany, you know, because the climate crisis is already affecting people everywhere in the world, but in Germany, well, first, it's maybe not effect, like climate change. In some places, you can still ignore it. But then again, the point is that Germany is a very wealthy country. So it's this is where the problem of climate justice comes in. Yes, maybe in Germany we can afford to mitigate the effects of climate change, but a lot of other people and countries are not. So I feel like in Germany we have this responsibility, especially because Germany is a country that was emitting a lot of CO2, just as the US, a lot of other Western countries, that we have to do something. But then again, people in Germany didn't care about it. So we were like, what do we do? And we decided to strike. So we went on a school strike and we called our movement Fridays for Future um, and it was went into a global movement. I'm actually not sure, it probably was in Turkey as well. Um, I'd love to hear more about this. Um, but in Germany, this was really big. And why was it big? I don't know if you've been to Germany, but when you go to Germany, you will find people, if you break a little rule, like for example, you go, you turn, you go over a red light or you talk loudly in a quiet train section, people will be like, what are you doing? Like, stop talking. So in Germany, we have this strong feeling of order. Like, rules are really important in Germany. It's a very cultural thing. Like, it goes back to Martin Luther, the reformist, who was... Anyway, we, we, in, we Germans, we like to obey rules. So what we did at the school strike movement, we said, why should we follow your rules if they're leading, leading us right into the climate crisis? So we broke one rule, and that rule was that we go to school. I mean, we still went to school, but we stopped going to school on Friday, once a week. And this went into a huge discussion all over Germany, like teachers were like, what are you doing? The kids are not going to school, what's going on? The politicians were involved, they were like, you know, politics and climate crisis, that's only something for adults, like you shouldn't talk about this. But this, and now talking about media, this led to a lot of journalists reporting on us because what we did is we created a conflict. We knew governments were not gonna talk about the climate crisis per se because it's so abstract, it's so far away, especially in Germany. But through our protests, we brought the climate crisis right to the doorsteps of many Germans. And, you know, parents were involved, teachers were involved, politicians were involved, so everyone started talking about the climate crisis. And that accumulated into a huge climate strike on the 20th of September 2019, where 1.3 million people were on the streets. And that, for, that was the second biggest protest in Germany that we've had so far. It was a huge protest. So that's the story I wanted to share about how the climate movement in Germany became so big. And then also tying into what you said about people here in Turkey and maybe other places not caring about the climate crisis, not because it's a problem, but because other problems are more important. I think that is such an important issue and I would love to talk more about that because I feel like that's also where the topic of 
climate justice comes in. Like, why would I tell a person who's not contributed to the climate crisis at all, maybe a farmer in Rwanda or wherever, what he has to do or not to do? Like, that is not the point. For me, the point is that the CO2 emitting countries like the US, like Germany, we need to cut back. We need to drop out of fossil fuels. We need to invest into renewables, and that's what we need to do. And so my final point is that, you know, a lot of people have this image of Germany as this like really environmental fr uh, friendly country. And in some ways we are, but I think what we really excelled at is having a climate friendly rhetoric. Like what we have in Germany is a lot of politicians, like you said, oh, the climate crisis, it's important, sustainability, it's important. But this is in a contrast to what is actually happening. And this is what our struggle in the climate movement in Germany is right now. How do we get politicians to not just talk about the climate crisis, but to act on it? So the next thing we did, also coming back to your question, we were like, if politicians are not changing something, we will go to court. We will drag them to court and have it like black and white, pinned down by the government that they're not doing enough because we knew that they were not doing enough. And this is actually a big success. So for me, like protesting, it is on different levels. Like it's so important to have the grassroots level local people, like activists like us doing, doing what needs to happen. But then again, we also need the legal um, path. So we go to court, we have all these rulings, that's also important. And then we have the government institutional arena and we also need this. So to wrap up, there's still a lot to do. Germany's not as environmental friendly as you think. For example, we opened a new coal mine, even though that was the same year that Germany said we will stop coal. We opened a new one. Now we want to build LNG gas terminals. Um, I mean, the, the war in Ukraine, that's had a big impact on what we do, um, like in Germany, like thinking about fossil fuels and renewables. But there is a real danger of a rollback like that people will now focus more on fossil fuels also because of economic reasons. So we need to be careful about that as well. I think I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you very much. Um, um, yeah, now I'm very glad to come to Aslam. Um, welcome. Aslam, you have, yeah, you're a lawyer, so you have a legal background. So um, I'm now looking forward to hear from you how um, maybe this way, like, it was uh, in Germany that uh, where climate activists went to court, but also in, in, in the Netherlands, um, climate activists went before to court. And um, I know like the Turkish government decided to ratify the Paris Agreement um, quite late. They are drafting the climate law at the moment. There has been like the um, Climate Council in February, um, where um, yeah, the climate movement and climate experts for all over Turkey came together. Um, yeah, so I would now, from your background, you attended the Climate Council, so I would be very interesting if you could share with us um, to what extent has the climate law and the discussion and the construction of the climate law, um, has the climate crisis been discussed, discussed also as a human rights crisis? Is this addressed? And if then the final climate law turns out to not fulfill um, the goals set in the Paris Agreement, um, do you think that actors in Turkey um, might choose the German and the D Dutch way and really go to court and sue for a better climate law? Okay, thanks. Uh, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. I had to change my seat. Um, now I'm under this. I didn't want to be under that spotlight without seeing you at all. First of all, I'd like to thank you, thank the organization committee for bringing us together. Now, just like Clara, let me um, introduce myself briefly. I, well, um, I, I think this is an important get together because in Turkey, the climate issue is not seen as a human rights issue. Um, sadly, that is not that is the case, and we need to ask this question and answer this question in a collective fashion. If this is a human rights issue, then how should we work uh, to sort of um, push things forward? How can we work together to claim our rights, and how can we hold politicians accountable? That um, is um, our right as citizens. And for long years, I worked in the field of human rights, and I see myself as a human rights lawyer. Um, that's how I've always defined myself. 
I've always tried to um, improve myself in this regard. And then I um, met the ecology um, struggle and I was the legal consultant of the Environmental uh, Association, Doa Derni. When you're a lawyer, when you're a lawyer interested in uh, environmental matters, as you would um, imagine, you take many people to court and you try to get cancellations and, and then another project pops up and, and then you take them to court. So in a way, um, uh, it, it, it, it's, it's exhaustion. You feel spent uh, as a lawyer uh, when you work in this field. But obviously, as you continue to work in this area, you also realize um, the following. When we were the lawyers of the Doha Dani Environmental Association, people were like, oh, are you, are you trying to defend flamingos, this and that? There were so many misconceptions about uh, what we did. And, uh, but then I realized, really, how important a life of a flamingo is and how we're all connected, just like Spinoza said. Um, us human beings, uh, you know, we are a con we're not a part of the nature, a mere part of the nature. Uh, we are just a small um, part. Um, and then you realize that as you defend your rights, you actually defend rights of the nature, rights of the environment, um, that, we're, you, that we're all in, in connected. And that changed my paradigm vis-a-vis -vis law and, um, you know, how I use the law. Yes, climate, climate change, climate crisis is man-made. And uh, it is a matter of human rights indeed. And in countries such as ours, human rights area is full of uh, infringements, violations, and um, a series of burning issues. Um, and our plate is full. Maybe that's why we do not prioritize the climate issue. And when we talk about human rights, um, you know, you know, when we talk about human rights, some people are, you know, we know that some people are dehumanized, and you know, we are against that. Uh, so, um, you know, we need to defend our rights vis-a-vis -vis the environment, and we need to realize that um, environment has an impact on our rights as well. And I also represent the Bar Association of um, Turkey uh, at that climate um, council. And we were discussing uh, many things in that committee. And um, in February, we had a summit in Konya and there were 600 participants. And it was uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic and we were 600 uh, people gathered there and none of us uh, to the best of our knowledge were contracted so we were happy and it has been months that we have been waiting for the decision and only last week it was announced uh, Turkey's nationally determined uh, uh, indicators NDIs and how uh, they what, what kind of commitment that uh, Turkey would make and by the way Turkey uh, has a lot of action plans uh, on uh, many issues, but it serves as a sort of wish list. No one reports or no one holds the government accountable, uh, as citizens, I mean. So the law on climate change, so if you look into the way the law was uh, prepared, if you look uh, at the way this climate council was organized, I mean, uh, it was not an inclusive council at all. I, we, I could not see uh, many women's organizations there. I could not see civil society representatives there. There was a discussion about just transition, but this discussion was held mostly with the business community stakeholders. There were no representatives from trade unions, for instance. Yes, in Turkey, trade unions do not have climate crisis in their agenda, uh, and perhaps they don't have any action plan yet. But on the other hand, uh, the Hranting Foundation or the organizers of this festival uh, considered that uh, as a question of human rights, and I believe this is very significant because uh, certain uh, CSOs are working on uh, the rights of the child or on the rights of people with disabilities, they are not yet aware that climate crisis uh, also uh, affects their lives and the uh, lives of the people that they serve.
So this should be uh, included in our right to life in a way that also covers the next generations. And I would like to also talk about this uh, process of uh, making a new legislation on uh, climate change. So uh, lawyers and experts should be involved in that. Uh, but we have not yet been proposed with any draft uh, law or any bill. Uh, of course, we will be following up on that. I mean, this is a climate uh, emergency. And uh, when we discuss it uh, from the perspective of human rights, then uh, it is not only a matter of just canceling a project. It is not only a matter of uh, repealing a license for a mining company. It has some other fundamental human rights related aspects. So I expect that in Turkey, we will have more room for this discussion. Uh, Perhaps you are well aware that uh, there was the destruction of a wetland um, in Marmara Union. And there was, uh, we filed uh, an action, a lawsuit against the Marmara Union because uh, these fishermen were requested to pay for rent and we uh, filed a lawsuit and we continue to uh, follow up on this particular case. Uh, the same goes uh, for uh, stopping uh, using uh, fossil fuels. So we will continue to uh, follow, up up, uh, follow up on all these actions. And how can we achieve that? Activists uh, from Turkey, experts, specialists, uh, they will work on these issues uh, and they will have to monitor uh, what's happening uh, in terms of climate crisis in Turkey. And uh, they, they need to advocate. Uh, we are all uh, uh, legal experts. We are also teaching law and uh, to uh, pursue justice. We need to uh, follow up on these causes. And I would like to talk even more about this in an extensive matter, but let me uh, stop right here right now. Um, I mean, we have heard now um, the situation of the media, how, how in, in Turkey it might be possible maybe to raise more awareness, but also the obstacles. Um, we have heard that there's a lot already going on in the environmental sector, so that um, also um, society is kind of fighting back if um, yeah, environmentally unfriendly decisions are made. Um, we heard the success from Germany. We also heard um, how important um, global uh, global connections because it's a global crisis so of course also like um, this has to be tackled globally and I think events like this where we can build networks are a good start and I would now open the floor um, for questions I'm not sure I think uh, you might need to um, use the mic or if uh, you, do you want to add something yeah okay you also want to add something okay then maybe you can already think about your questions um, and then um, when you want to write them and yani insan hakları bölümüne ben de bir şey I would like to also uh, add another point about the human rights uh, issue discussion because I don't want to miss out some important points. So this matter of political choices. So the political choice to uh, struggle for climate or not struggle for climate. And why it uh, constitutes um, a political choice. So this issue of equality, if we look into the title of this session, it is uh, why is the struggle against climate crisis a human rights issue? Unfortunately, uh, it all boils down to the notion of equality because people uh, con perceive that the climate change will not affect everyone in the same fashion. Uh, indeed, all of us will be affected, all our uh, nature, oceans, everything will be affected, but of course some will be affected more than others. When we look at the carbon emissions historically, uh, of course it is the developed countries, industrialized countries, 
such as the US, they are the uh, main polluters. So it's the US, the EU, Germany. So uh, th these countries are not so green in inverted commas. So we need to uh, remember the responsibility of these uh, polluter countries, uh, both for today, but also historically. And the other question is, who is affected by uh, this crisis? So there is a huge gap between the developed world and the developing world, both in terms of weathering the storm and uh, coping with the challenges but also in terms of access to a global climate financing. So uh, Philippines, Bangladesh, Sudan, Ethiopia, sub-Saharan countries or island uh, states, Turkey, Mediterranean countries, uh, we already feel the impact of climate uh, crisis. And we will certainly not be impacted in the same manner. By the way, uh, there are also certain uh, vulnerable groups within the developed world, within the developed countries. There are already people who have less access uh, to resources. Covering Climate Now initiative is an international uh, consortium in climate journalism. with um, more than journalists, more than 100 journalists uh, from Reuters to Associated Press. And uh, I was in a jury for a climate journalism prize. And uh, uh, the prize was awarded to the Globe and Mail uh, newspaper. So in Canada, they covered the uh, the heat waves and then the floods. And when we look into these news stories uh, that this newspaper covered, uh, the best storytelling was uh, from Vancouver. Of course, there are hundreds of deaths, but they looked into the breakdown of the climate related deaths. Uh, so when they looked into the neighbor at neighborhood level, they found out that it is always the poor people in suburban areas uh, who has high, higher uh, death rates because they have limited access to forests, to trees. They don't have ACs at their homes. That's why uh, even in the same city, uh, certain neighborhoods are more vulnerable to climate impacts. And some uh, vulnerable groups uh, will be more exposed. Who are those groups? Women, the elderly, children, LGBTI plus individuals. And it is because the climate crisis does not impact us at the same level. Countries, um, in, in impoverished countries or island states, countries with limited access uh, already experience significant problems. We can give more examples to this. So what can we do to change this uh, and to avoid this crisis? Again, I will uh, criticize uh, the industry because there are certain uh, focal points behind these political choices. Of course, this uh, giant uh, fossil fuel companies uh, or these giant uh, lobbying networks uh, will not be uh, downsizing their operations just for the sake of uh, having less emissions or for the sake of human lives. This is not going to be a realistic expectation. We are also well aware that these uh, giant companies, these tycoons, they have a certain influence uh, both on the government and the media, and they also uh, invest in greenwashing. So when it comes to vulnerable groups, we need to see more rights-based advocacy so that we can have more uh, influence on the government, more influence on the media. Uh, only through that way we can raise more awareness among public. 
And in this way, we can give more agency and voice to the countries who need to be more actively participating in uh, climate-related decision-making processes. But very roughly speaking, uh, we are all affected, but we are not all affected in the same way. And media should play its role uh, to uh, <coughs> lend an ear uh, to the most vulnerable groups. Um, the European Green Deal set by the European Union might lead for some change because, um, yeah, it's, uh, Turkey is one of the biggest trading partners of the EU and with the um, CBAM regulation they would face uh, yeah, a lot of costs if they are not changing the industry, but that's a total different topic, not to open that. I already saw some raised hands, I'm not sure, I think you might need to get a microphone, you wanted to add something as well, but maybe to get you in. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you very much for this very informative uh, session. I'm one of those politicians that you have just mentioned. Uh, so I was uh, following very closely the Around Think Foundations Festival for the last two days. My name is Turan Aydoğan. I'm the Istanbul uh, deputy of CHP, uh, Republican People's Party. So, uh, we have heard criticism uh, about media, but there is one uh, thing that cannot uh, be ignored. The neoliberal policies flourishing worldwide, uh, and uh, they have uh, also led to populist repressive regimes. We see the examples in Russia, Turkey, Hungary, uh, so these policies do not recognize any boundaries. So it is now a uh, common place. And uh, th there is a common threat in these authoritarian populist regimes. And uh, this is also something we try to struggle in our country. So there are these certain structures that exert control over uh, media, the judiciary, uh, and they manage to uh, infiltrate any uh, intentional uh, mechanisms into the legislation in order to uh, curb human rights struggle. Uh, of course, we can uh, use different methods. We can uh, try to look into that through the lens of equality. It is indeed uh, a human rights uh, issue. However, we have now arrived uh, at such a crossroads that the civil society should directly interfere in these problems because we are now almost in this bipolar or binary world. On the one hand, we have the authoritarian regimes, and on the other hand, we have more uh, democratic regimes uh, that uh, would embrace dialogue and participation. Uh, I mean, Turkey and other uh, populist uh, countries with popular, populist leaders that I just mentioned, we have to join forces uh, to act against this neoliberal order. If we fail to do this, I think all these debates will not uh, be uh, meaningful. Uh, they will not uh, have the agency to change anything at all. As I said, I'm uh, an Istanbul MP, and yes, we have the Turkish Parliament, we have the Committee on Environment, but we cannot achieve anything uh, over there because the uh, politics have uh, completely cut off its relation with the civil society, so we need to uh, uh, wait a total um, mobilization, uh, a total struggle, I would say, against a uh, climate crisis. In my own uh, city, Rize, Ikizdere, there are people who don't want to change their lives in this neoliberal order. There are women who would like to protect their uh, nature. And there are also politicians like myself uh, who uh, stand uh, against uh, the climate crisis. So we should join our forces. Turkey did sign the Paris Agreement, but it took us many years to, to lobby uh, for Turkey to sign the Paris Agreement. And we all know very well why Turkey signed this agreement so late. It's just only for 
financial purposes, having an access uh, to uh, climate uh, financing, and also then the, there would be some UN sanctions. Turkey would not be able to use international loans uh, if uh, Turkey wouldn't have signed uh, the uh, Paris Agreement. And uh, there is also this uh, Canal Istanbul project, the, the mega uh, canal project. We all uh, spoke up against this, but I believe that we are uh, we all have uh, responsibility in that. We wrote petitions uh, uh, worldwide to international community, but we haven't heard back. So uh, we uh, need more solidarity at international scale. Yes, as politicians, we can always be the scapegoats. Uh, but uh, for instance, I keep my doors open to anyone. I always make an effort to uh, be in dialogue with anyone. I work with many uh, CSOs, many organizations. However, it is not really possible to continue these activities if we don't have any breathing space uh, for uh, CSOs. I have taken lots of notes during these two days, and I will be taking my notes back to the Turkish parliament. So everyone talks about development, but what really matters is a, a rights-based development. Uh, and we cannot really uh, join our forces, and this is uh, mostly because of the disinformation uh, imposed on us by these populist regimes. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. In addition to our panel, also like a perspective um, from the political side. Um, thank you. I, there were more hands up before. Yeah. Hello, thank you very much. Um, I have a question to Clara and maybe Julia, but I would also like love to hear the opinion of the, I forgot your names, other um, two panelists. Um, you have talked a lot about the su success story, let's say success story of the movement, Friday for Future movement, and also the topic of climate culture, uh, climate justice. And I think, um, uh, Özlem mentioned that the question of uh, climate justice is not only a question of the gap between the north and the south, but we all know that especially in countries like Germany, um, the ecological movement is a very privileged movement, so um, it's not only a question between north and south, it's the same question in Germany itself or countries like northern countries like Germany. So my question would be, um, what do you think the movements should do um, to open, open or represent, on the one hand, um, marginalized group, migrants um, in their inner organization? So I think the Institute for Protest um, Research, um, for example, wrote that, um, that people of color are really under, underrepresented in these movements. Um, and this is not only a question of representation, it's also a question of the topics we're focused on in this movement. And I'm wondering, is this, um, what do you think for civil society, um, is this a too big burden on the shoulders of some students who are doing this protest and are finally politicized in these countries like Germany? I mean, it's, it's really um, a big thing that the youth movements are so politicized through Fridays for Future. Is this too, too, a too big thematically burden or should it open more to these topics of climate justice? Sorry, it was a long question, but I tried to sum up yeah. somehow. Absolutely. Thanks so much for that question. It's such an important question and we can't yeah, talk enough about that. So. I mean, it basically ties into what we were discussing before and what you were sharing, for example, about the situation in Turkey, where, like, for some people, climate change, like, why should they worry about climate change if on a um, short term, you know, people are worried about getting fired from their job or um, having enough food for their family or other, or race, racist struggles or whatever. I mean, I had to think of the situation 
in the US right now. I was there um, two weeks ago, um, actually in Buffalo, and you know, I, I went there and I was really motivated to talk about climate change, and everyone was like, yeah, you know, it's an important topic, but I'm sorry, I just can't deal with this right now. You know, I'm last week there was a racist attack in our neighborhood. Um, tomorrow, I don't know if I have enough food for my kids on the table, and I was like, who am I to then tell them why are you not worrying about this? So it, you're absolutely right, and we really have this problem in Germany. So the Fridays for Future movement I was talking about, it's a very white movement and very privileged movement, as you said. And um, so, so this is why I also think, t thinking about what happens next, because you know we had big protests for three years and everything was great, but you know still not enough has changed and in Germany we're still not doing enough to really you know break down on fossil fuels and what I personally think needs to happen and this ties to your question about solutions I think we need to build a movement a global movement that goes beyond the topic of climate change and ties into the problems of people in their everyday lives and we haven't managed to do this so far and I think people are too focused on this like one topic of climate change and I think that's a wrong thinking from the beginning like we, we shouldn't think about this but it's connected to everything you're talking about intersectionality like how also human rights like you know women and um, um, people queer people they're mostly also going to be mostly affected or are already affected by climate change and in order to build a really inclusive movement that is attractive for people outside of our white privileged bubble, we need to build this movement and we need to take on the problems that people have right now. We need to take on economic issues, we need to take on um, you know, racist issues, we need to build this into a big movement. And I don't think we're there yet, and I really, really hope that this is what we're gonna focus on in the next time, because also, to be very honest, I've been campaigning for like three years now and I don't see how else we're gonna make this. Like, from a budget, um, climate budget perspective, I would say we have another like seven years maybe to make the two degree um, goal. And I'm, I have to admit, like also talking about being tired, there is this like disappointment in me or this tiredness of being like, I've been working on this topic for so long and so many other people have and always saying the same things, like, you know, having this talking points, knowing how it's already affecting people and still nothing is changing because yeah, what well, we just heard, like neoliberalism, all this like logics that are in our system, the underlying beliefs that we're not fundamentally challenging. And I think we can, but only if we really think about what people care about in their daily lives and bring that together. So thanks very much. Thank you. There was another question in the... Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very quickly. Um, I know we don't have much time, so um, when it comes to vulnerable groups, um, we know that there are post-humanism um, discussions that are quite trendy these days, and animals, animal rights um, somehow um, are not on the agenda. And I, as far as I can tell, as a vegan activist and as someone who is part of the ecology struggle, I think that, the, that there needs to be more rapprochement between these two movements. We need to need, need more alignment between these two movements. And also one more thing that I'd like to say is that, uh, yes, um, climate crisis, more than a human rights issue, I think it's an animal rights issue. But as you said yourself, um, politicians and um, society at large need to be convinced. We need to raise awareness. And it's as if, it seems as if, um, Obviously, many vulnerable groups are affected by the climate crisis, but animal rights are not even mentioned. And those who are involved in the animal rights struggle when it comes to the climate issue, um, they are they stand within the realm of the animal rights movement rather than the ecology movement. And we talked about this previously. We talked about industrialization. We know that if, if I'm not mistaken, again. Um, the number one factor for climate crisis, the number one cause for um, carbon dioxide emissions is the animal husbandry industry. And uh, there is no fight or struggle against uh, that industry. I think if we do that, we, we would create more alignment between these two movements. Rather than a human rights emphasis, I think the emphasis should be on animal rights. What would you say about that? Thank you. And here's what I'd like to say about this. Yes, the animal rights struggle 
um, and um, speciesism, vegan activism um, are, are hot topics in Turkey. We debate these topics in Turkey as well. But um, I could also say that human rights, animal rights and um, environment rights, I mean, that's the struggle that we're engaged in. And the nature, the environment encompasses this all, I think. And um, uh, unless we understand the relationship between the part and the whole, we will not be able to create alignment between these movements. Just like you indicated, um, those who are involved in um, the climate crisis, uh, climate struggle, uh, human rights defenders, um, I think should know uh, much about biodiversity, um, gene diversity, species that diversity, um, because these are all interlinked with the um, climate issue. And um, yes, vegan activists and animal rights defenders um, actually um, focus on the link between um, the, the biodiversity crisis and the climate crisis, and that's their stance. Uh, that should be their stance on, on, on this, and this would help us overcome the um, discussions of speciesism. Um, and um, ethics between um, things that are alive and things that are not alive. This is at the gist of uh, legal philosophy. Um, I think it's a fruitful discussion to have. Obviously, we shouldn't just focus on the human um, element um, because uh, such an approach would not help us uh, fix this um, problem. We should not see the nature as a resource. We should not see animals as a resource. Uh, or, or see water resources as a resource. Um, you know, there is no overcoming this crisis if you do that. And yes, we're going through this crisis. We're all on, you know, going through the same storm, but we're not on the same boat. We have different privileges, different status of privilege, and no one should be left behind. No species should be left behind, and we should all get together under the roof of uh, our mother nature. And that's the struggle that awaits us. I, I'd like to also say something. Yes, you're right, but when we talk about human rights, yes, I am also someone who favors a rights-based approach, and yes, animal rights and species rights should be a part of this um, in the media, and when you work as an advocate, I think that is um, terribly important. Um, the oceans and the wildlife, I mean, um, all, of, all of these will be impacted by... Uh, or are being impacted by the climate crisis. So um, we think along the same lines. But um, yes, in the media, perhaps uh, we need to revise the language that we use um, and correct our um, language. We should be more overarching, uh, I think. And when we talk about climate crisis, yes, and, uh, you know, I've also talked about carbon emissions, this and that, but in order to preserve the wildlife and biodiversity, I, also we need to do a lot, and these are intertwined. Um, and so what, what should we say? Uh, rights-based? Yes, definitely we should be rights-based and um, solution-oriented in our news coverage, and um, uh, that's what I... That's what I wanted to say. Uh, we should be, and when we talk, say rights based, obviously it includes human beings, animals, wildlife, uh, vulnerable groups, um, oceans. Uh, it's a set of principles that I encompasses all of these different elements. So uh, actually, we're on the same page. How the next program is, because we're three minutes over. Uh, there's one other question, but I think we wrap up here. Um, yeah. Sorry. I think, like, uh, okay. because, like, the program will start, so I'm very sorry. Uh, the, the, the next panel will start soon. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Um, I think um, the speakers will also be yeah. here around, so um, you can maybe also ask the questions afterwards. Thank you very much to the speakers, to your insights. Thank Thanks. you very much for your questions, and enjoy the festival. We'd like to thank our speakers for their contributions. We value your opinion, so please scan this QR code and fill out the assessment form. That would be great. Jan Kazan will be performing in a minute, and at 7, Jumbush Cemat will be performing for us. We'd like to thank you for being with us over the course of these two days. Hopefully this has been fun, and see you the next time around. Thank you.
Ranting Vakfı Sivil Toplumu Güçlendirme Hibe Programı'nda neler yapıldı? İzmir'de ayrımcılıkla mücadele için çalışan Mültecilerle Dayanışma Derneği, insan hakları odaklı film yapımı, ses, ışık, kamera kullanımı ve kurgu konularında gençlere yönelik atölyeler yaptı. Dernek, hazırladığı 14 film ve kamu spotuyla geniş kitlelere ulaştı. İstanbul'da Engelli Hakları alanında çalışan Toplumsal Haklar ve Araştırmalar Derneği, engellilerin maruz kaldığı ayrımcılığa ilişkin olarak saha araştırmasına dayanan sayısal ve somut veriler ortaya koyan bir izleme ve raporlama çalışması yaptı. Kamu kurumlarıyla görüşen dernek çalışanları savunuculuk faaliyetleri yürüttü. Bitlis'te toplumsal cinsiyet eşitliği alanında çalışan Bitlis Girişimci Kadın Derneği, kadınlara tiyatro, ses, diksiyon, dans, bedensel farkındalık, yaratıcı yazma ve hikaye anlatıcılığı dersleri verdi. Bitlis'te 20 kadın bu proje kapsamında 11 tiyatro oyunu sahneledi. İstanbul'da insan hakları alanında çalışan Toplum ve Hukuk Araştırmaları Vakfı, avukatların güçlenmesi için hak ihlalleri ve yargı mekanizmaları hakkında avukat eğitim modülü hazırladı, ve kapasite geliştirme eğitimleri verdi. Vakıf, yaptığı haritalama çalışmaları ve animasyon videolarıyla hak ihlallerine dair farkındalığın yükselmesini sağladı. İstanbul'da, Türkiye'deki Yahudi kültürünün yaşatılması için hafıza alanında faaliyetlerde bulunan 500. Yıl Vakfı Türk Musevileri Müzesi, Türkiye Yahudileri ile sözlü tarih görüşmeleri yaptı ve bu görüşmeler ışığında bir arada yaşama kültürünü güçlendirmek için çevrimiçi sergi, belgesel ve kitap hazırladı. İstanbul'da işçilerin çalışma ve yaşam koşullarının iyileştirilmesine dönük faaliyetlerde bulunan Temiz Giysi Kampanyası Derneği, göçmenlerin en çok çalıştığı 13 farklı sektörde karşılaşılan meslek hastalıkları ve çalışan hakları hakkında Arapça ve Türkçe broşürler yayımladı, bilgilendirici videolar hazırladı. Hakkari'de toplumsal cinsiyet eşitliği için çalışan Yüksekova Sosyal Etki ve Kültür Derneği, saha araştırması yaparak kadınların ve çocukların ihtiyaçlarını ortaya koyan bir rapor hazırladı. Kadın ve çocuklarla düzenledikleri oyun grupları ve mahalle toplantılarıyla toplumsal cinsiyete dayalı şiddetin fark edilmesi için çalıştı. İstanbul'da LGBTİ artı hakları alanında çalışan SPOT, avukatların LGBTİ artı hakları konusunda farkındalığını yükseltmek amacıyla rehber ve kılavuz hazırladı. Karşılaşılan hak ihlallerinin yargıya taşınması sürecinde avukatları güçlendirmeye dönük eğitim çalışmaları düzenledi. Kars'ta hafıza ve kültürel miras alanında çalışan Toplumsal Araştırma ve Özgün Düşün Derneği, şehrin çok kültürlü tarihini anlatan bir kitap ve tanıtım rehberi hazırladı. Barış kültürünün kurulmasına ve bir arada yaşamın geliştirilmesine katkıda bulunmak hedefiyle çevrim içi bir sergi açtı ve belgesel film hazırladı. İstanbul'da sansür ve otosansür alanında izleme çalışmaları yapan P24 Bağımsız Gazetecilik Derneği, Susma adlı internet sitesiyle ifade özgürlüğü, sansür ve otosansür üzerine haberler, özel röportajlar ve medya taramaları yaptı. Kültür sanat alanında atölyeler yapan dernek yıllık sansür raporu yayımladı. İzmir'de gençlik hakları alanında çalışan Pi Gençlik Derneği, gençlik dernekleri ve çalışanlarını güçlendirmek için çalıştaylar yaptı. Kapsayıcı bir gençlik ağı oluşturarak insan hakları eğitimi veren dernek, bu alanda herkesin kullanımına açık bir çevrimci kaynak ve e-kütüphane oluşturdu. İstanbul'da çeşitlilik odaklı insan kaynakları yönetim süreci için çalışan Türkiye İnsan Yönetimi Derneği Peryon, insan kaynaklarında kapsayıcı düzenlemeler yapılması ve bireysel özgürlüklere saygılı bir çalışma ortamı yaratılması için eğitimler verdi. Dernek, saha araştırmasına dayalı bir etki analiz raporu ve animasyon videolar hazırladı. Diyarbakır'da Sur ilçesinin hafızasının diri tutulması ve kayda alınması için çalışan Diyarbakır Kültür Tabiat Varlıklarını Koruma ve Yaşatma Derneği, kültürel miras ve hafıza alanında atölye, seminer ve çalıştaylar yaptı. Dernek, sözlü tarih görüşmeleri ve teknik fotoğraflama çalışmalarının ardından Sur bölgesinin hafızasını yaşatmak için kitap hazırladı ve çevrim içi sergi açtı. Türkiye'de işkence ve diğer ağır ciddi insan hakları ihlallerinin engellenmesi ve ayrımcılıkla mücadele için çalışan Türkiye İnsan Hakları Vakfı, hak ihlallerini izleme ve raporlama çalışması yaparak sanal bir bilgi bankası oluşturdu, herkes için insan hakları kampanyasıyla hak ihlallerine dikkat çeken videolar hazırladı. İzmir'de adil üretim süreçleri için çalışan Türetim Ekonomisi Derneği, Kaz Dağları'nda yürüttüğü projelerle iklim ve biyoçeşitlilik krizine karşı kadın emeğinin mücadelesini anlamak ve ortaklaştırmak için bir dayanışma ağı oluşturdu. Atölyeler ve eğitim çalışmaları yapan dernek, saha araştırmaları ve raporlama çalışması yaptı ve belgesel film çekti. 
hibe programı kapsamında ayrımcılıkla mücadele eden ve bir arada yaşamı savunan çalışmaları desteklemekten gurur duyuyoruz.
Welcome back to our uh, next session, which is Stories of Coexistence. Here we will have the Bahtasheher University founding rector, uh, Professor Trukar Kulic. He is uh, a professor of uh, neuroscience and he's graduated from Hacettepe University and he completed his degree in um, anatomy. In December 2011, uh, he was selected to the World uh, Academy of Science, Harvard, Yale, and Milana Polytechnic, and John Hopkins Universities are among the 10 universities where he was offered a visitor, uh, visiting professor uh, J. And other than uh, many important awards between 2005 and 2010, he uh, received a uh, an award for his brain tumor research. He published more than 200 articles, uh, New Science, uh, Brain and Citizenship, What is Life and What is Brain, uh, are the uh, books that he penned. He has been the co-founder, uh, rector of Bahtisar University, and he continues his uh, research activities today. He will talk about the stories of coexistence, the new culture brain research in uh, teaching, interconnectedness. So he will uh, tell us more about this concept, interconnectedness. I'm delighted and very excited to be here because when I was approached by the foundation uh, for this uh, talk, uh, it took me some time uh, to uh, reflect on what I can uh, offer you, but then uh, I decided that interconnectedness would be the topic. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm a, a neurologist, so uh, of course I'm uh, very much preoccupied with how brain works and how we think. And in the United States, uh, uh, I have been uh, making a research to better understand how a uh, brain works. At the beginning, we uh, only thought that brain uh, was uh, just uh, an organ uh, that has certain functions. But later on, uh, we start to, to comprehend that a brain uh, is an organ where all the creative uh, activity takes place. So we have a, a biological information system with more than uh, 20,000 uh, neurons and there are uh, 100 trillion uh, interconnected uh, networks, network of neurons. So how does brain create our thoughts uh, and uh, create our conscious and we want to, to understand if we can uh, offer a mathematical uh, solution. And we started to gather our first data in 2005. Uh, and what you see on the brain is not only limited to an electrical uh, uh, flow, but it is a video that illustrates how brain functions and how our thoughts are created. So there is a network of neurons uh, and uh, through their interconnectedness, uh, our brain functions. And this can give rise to very important transformations in science, including methodological transformations. And this also offered us a brand new perspective uh, on how we understand life as it is. So we have already uh, arrived in new findings that we did not foresee at the onset. So we should not only limit ourselves to how a brain functions, uh, but beyond that, we also uh, have come to understand that uh, life itself uh, is a network of uh, information and the most important news is that now we have a mathematical model uh, which we can use for this purpose. So we are now uh, faced with a brand new perspective on how we comprehend life and this changing 
uh, perspective is not only limited to uh, neuroscience or artificial intelligence, but it is so vital uh, that it can indeed uh, change the life as we know it. So, how uh, does the brain uh, produce uh, information or how uh, it represents uh, or builds our conscious? So that was our initial question. And we also, at that time, assumed that our brain is the most sophisticated uh, information processing uh, organ. What do you think? What would be the most uh, component, uh, mo most uh, competent information processing uh, um, object? It is the very life itself. Because the life is uh, also made up of different uh, minds, different uh, conscious uh, that are all interconnected. And once again, there is a real mathematical methodology behind it. And the whole effort of science uh, is very much uh, to do with getting closer to the reality. Even though we cannot uh, fully achieve a real life uh, methodology, we always aspire to get closer uh, to the real-life situations by making use of uh, scientific methods. So how come brain uh, produces or creates thoughts? I'm going back to the initial question we have. So there is, I call it the Newton Descartes uh, paradigm or school of thinking and I believe that uh, this question now brings this new potential to transform uh, our understanding. And in order to achieve that, different branches of science should work together, uh, particularly in countering uncertainty. As we navigate through uncertainty as human beings, uh, we uh, uh, somehow uh, hold, hold grip on certain things. Previously, it was the chemistry uh, in the 18th century, in the 19th century, perhaps it was uh, the genetics. And in 21st century, uh, the icebreaker was per, per, perhaps neuroscience along with artificial intelligence. So this, uh, what we have resorted to as we navigate through uncertainty and other social sciences and other uh, works of art also uh, pay us the way uh, in, that, in that direction. So as of today, what is the fundamental thing that changed our uh, understanding uh, as compared to previous centuries? So as the uh, sons or inheritors of uh, Newton and Beckhart, we always uh, paid uh, due diligence to analysis and synthesis. Uh, in other words, to look into different components, different parts of the whole. So we first need to uh, reduce everything down to uh, its components, the main components, along with its value and the data that comes along with it. So this is the methodology we use. And today, we are about to add a new layer on top of that. So what really matters is not the parts that make the whole, but rather the interaction among these parts and components. And this brings along a new paradigm. So the main building block uh, for life is not atom, but rather information. Yet this very information that the main building block of uh, the main building block of life is not atoms, uh, but information uh, is, I believe, a groundbreaking modeling technique. And we gradually come to uh, understand that there is this intercontact connectedness. Uh, on the right hand side and on the left hand side you see uh, cosmica uh, interconnectedness of the universe so we can use and apply the same uh, mathematical model 
So gradually, we transition uh, from uh, working on the question how brain uh, produces uh, thoughts. We ask ourselves new questions about life and universe itself. So we can use the same mathematical methodology uh, to respond uh, to the question of uh, how uh, we uh, create life. Here you see the neurons in the cells, and there are the stem cells. The first thing they do, as you see on the left-hand side, uh, they create a space for interconnectedness. So the existing space uh, does not only uh, help with interconnection, but we also see the tendency to create new patterns so in essence, what we call as information is not present as a molecule or as an object as such. But it is more like information uh, emerging as a pattern, as a texture in the brain, uh, waxing and waning all the time. Why is that important? This is important because our existing paradigm on information or access to information is shifting. What do I mean by that? Here we may have uh, an unknown area or unknown space. You see 12 dots. Let's assume they represent different neurons and their relation to one another uh, changes constantly you have just seen four squares or you have seen four triangles and now you see a star and you keep seeing different patterns or shapes and these 12 points represent neurons and they would tell us they would reveal us more information about uh, the common threads of the triangle or the squares or the star. So we have these 12 points, 12 dots, and we uh, take all of them one by one. We look into them separately. So if it's the brain, then we look into neurons. If it's the liver, then we look into the cells. If it's a social web, social network, then we look into uh, every single unit. But our job is not uh, finished uh, right there. What we understand is that the, the sum, uh, I, the, the total of uh, all these different components uh, is more than uh, the total sum. So this is something we have difficulty in understanding. And now we are able to better respond to this uh, question. Going back to these 12 points or dots, if we look at this pattern and see this as a piece of information, then we will understand uh, we should not only look into the parts or dots separately, but we need to look into the interconnectedness of different uh, parts. We need to understand how uh, each uh, point relates to one another. And then we can here talk about the randomness, because there is a certain math uh, behind this uh, randomness, uh, and that also holds true uh, for uh, our thoughts, for thinking. On the left hand side, you see these uh, 12 dots that represent neurons, and now on the right hand side, you see 36,000 neurons. These are in the uh, amygdala of uh, living uh, rats. If you uh, offer uh, food or water right in front of the rat, then uh, the rat will need to go through a thinking process uh, to make a decision or to make a choice. Uh, and this decision-making process has its uh, geometrical representation too. You see 
that uh, 36,000 neurons uh, of this thread has a certain uh, mathematical and ge uh, geometrical uh, representation. We don't have to understand this right away right now. But for the very first time in history, we uh, came to the conclusion that the act of thinking has uh, some maths behind it. Since, 19, uh, since the 1950s, uh, there was this concept of Parisian mathematics, and we now have the new forms of uh, these uh, mathematics, and we can call it as information uh, mathematics. And there is a certain need for that. And mathematicians are leading this process of uh, seeking scientific answers. And most of the awards and prizes are also granted uh, to such scholars who are working on that. Here is what I mean. I first started using this slide in 2016. What do we mean by this interconnectedness mathematics? So the existing mathematics, in other words, calculus, represent the uh, stationary state of words on the wires. But if we want to look into that as a flow, then we need to uh, look into the snapshots one after another. Uh, we need to go through so many of these uh, snapshot, snapshots uh, in a split second. But this would not help us explain how our brain works. That's the reason why we need a brand new methodology. That's what I said in 2016. So we don't need uh, this uh, stationary state of words. We need to understand the momentary change of motion here. We need to understand the uh, momentary uh, movements of birds on the wire. And uh, this was uh, due to the need that we felt. We felt the need for a brand new explanation. Here I would like to tell you about the Giorgio Parisio. So this is a bird flock, and over time uh, they uh, did a mathematical modeling uh, on how birds uh, in the flock interact with one another over time. So we see a certain pattern here, just as the neurons in the brain and how they uh, create information. So. And all the Abel prizes uh, and other uh, prestigious prizes uh, are now granted to mathematicians who are particularly working on this subject. And Sullivan, uh, with its uh, topological research on brain and how it can influence our thinking process. We don't have to understand all these uh, researches right now, but my message is that the mathematical modeling that we use in order to uncover uh, interconnectedness in brain or how brain functions can also inform us in other fields. We can use the very same mathematical uh, methodologies uh, and use them to interpret uh, new fields, for instance, social sciences and uh, life sciences. Can now, uh, brought, can now be brought together thanks to this methodology. So we are now transitioning from the science of parts and components uh, to the interconnectedness of parts and components. And neuroscience goes from complexity to uh, to more uh, simplicity and coupled with 
uncertainty and struggle against uncertainty, we walk together as we navigate these uncertainties. Newton and uh, Beckhart and the culture that we inherited and the iconic uh, formula like F equals to MA and other formulas, they don't only represent a mathematical formula, but there is an entire culture behind it. Uh, I have just told you about Giorgio Parise. Uh, he uh, has also uh, offered a certain formula. It is just an iconic formula, just like F equals to uh, MA. We need to look into the uh, parts in order to understand the whole. But building upon that, we now have a new uh, school of uh, thinking that we need to understand uh, the interconnectedness because it was Newton and Beckhardt's uh, duty to look into the different parts, but now we need to understand this interaction. So, last November, the Nobel Physics Prize was given to Giorgio Parisi. He had shown the interaction of birds with one another, but it wasn't only that. He also showed the mathematics of this interconnectedness, and he almost changed the basic rules of physics. For instance, the copper and iron elements, when they get together, these atoms decide and this interconnectedness and information mathematics indicates that. So we use the formula to understand the relations of birds with one another, and it's the same formula. So the Nobel Committee now acknowledges the information mathematics and its use in physics. So the use of any information in practical life is what is awarded by the Nobel Prize. And for the first time, the Nobel Committee accredited this. So we slowly started to understand that the response to how brain creates mind is actually about how we can create a better life. So it gives us certain um, tips about that as well. To this festival's topic is coexistence. So this is one of the themes here, interconnectedness. And we have a math now to describe that. And so this can have something that corresponds to the human mind. Well, the building block of life is not atom, but information. So Understanding that changes our perspective to life. It creates an important paradigm. I am actually in the editorial board of this article. There was this text that was sent. So in the prefrontal cortex, there are 300 neurons and they connect to each other and they started to examine the math behind that. There was a study around that, and the first results started to come. Let's say somebody lives for 100 years. When you just take those 300 neurons, in none of the two moments in life, these 300 neurons can create the same pattern. When you are listening to me, when you are going to ask your questions to me, it's just going to be those 300 neurons. When you take those 300 neurons, when they interact with one another, they create a certain pattern. I talked about the neurons of 36,000 rats, and it's not the same with that pattern. So we have a different level of understanding now. So our scientific methodology has started to change. What does that mean? 400, before, 400 years before Christ, Aristoteles says, if I had 10 kilos of iron and one kilo of iron on both hands, the heavier one would hit the ground first if I let them go. So there is an acceptance here. There are two important things in the, uh, here, assumption and acceptance. So this is about induction. And humans believe this for 2,000 years. Until when? 
Galileo goes up to the Pisa Tower and he throws this 10 kilos of iron and 1 kilo of iron on the ground. So he experiments with the idea and until that experiment the assumption is still there. And after this experiment the assumption's name is changed to hypothesis. An assumption or hypothesis to be concluded as right or wrong needs several times of experimentation. It needs to be tried enough times. So we have deduction on top of induction. This is how reform and renaissance create is, is created. And this is how people's perspective to life changes. When Galileo conducts the experiment, he says Aristoteles may be wrong. And when he says that, we understand that human thinking has a new layer of looking at the world. So we see we are on the verge of a new paradigm shift. So there is this deduction that added on top of induction. It has changed human thinking. And 400 years, this science of interconnectedness is now creating a new perspective too. And the science of interconnectedness is about us, about the people around us, it's about the nature, it's about our mental problems. It brings about new, new perspectives to each and every one of those issues. And this is thanks to the collaboration of neuroscience and AI, in other words, information sciences. And this brings about a new culture with it. It has such potential. Newton, Bacon, Descartes created a new culture of science with pluses and minuses. In fact, today, in responding to life's several challenges, we uh, the civilization is having difficulty. But I think that you know, human life used to be three thirty-eight years, and now it's ninety years. Uh, we went to the moon, so the civilization is nothing to disregard or underestimate. But this also brings about certain responsibilities. We are in the system, we all exist in the system, so we see that there is no response to how to create a better world. We sense that. And now we need to give a new answer. We need a different paradigm to respond to that. In fact, with Corona, we experienced that. We learned this process very well. The first thing that Corona taught us you know, uh, you remember March, April, May 2020 when everybody was locked down. Back in those days, we realized those institutions that were deemed important became insignificant just in a few days, like the stock exchange, banks, the war machines. They disappeared in a few days. After several centuries, for the first time, humankind couldn't fight. They couldn't wage war during the corona period. So during the pandemic, we started to notice this change in information. Well, going back to the relation with AI, as I said, AI goes from simple to complex, whereas neuroscience goes from complex to the simple. So this, you know, they're co-creating this change in perspective. So we're talking about a new math we're talking about new perspective towards the unknown. And what brings us about, you know, Newton's system is like the billiards ball system, the apple falling on the floor or the gravity law or atoms interacting with one another. So they were all like those billiard balls. That is how it's modeled. But that model, yes, that modeling worked, of course, but now this modeling is not adequate. We know that. So we need a new modeling. And this modeling will be taught by the brain. So it comes about based on the question of how the brain creates the mind. There was this consortium in Europe. We obtained some data and we reached some results and that was about it. Now I'll talk about another topic that is about the neurons in the brain and their interaction and the image it creates and how we understand by MR and the new understanding both about that. We call this connecton imaging. You know, there is genes and genome. And now 
This is about the connections in the brain, so we call it the connectome. In Turkish, connectome is nörozihin, like neuromind, so until we find a better term, we can use this term. Connectome is changing all the time. For instance, you see a photo here, the Amazon River, it's an image from, the, from a satellite. The delta of the Amazon River is changing every season. And this is true for the brain. The information is kept in patterns and the creation of this knowledge is changing all the time, just like this delta. So the pathways where this information is processed can be now viewed in MRI. Of course, we cannot view the neurons one by one currently, unfortunately, but every fiber here is about 150 million neurons functioning together. So this biochemical river created by information can now be translated in an MR image. For instance, on the left you see a tumor removed during surgery and there is some scar where the tumor is removed but the other fibers are back in their same place. So now this is done, used uh, routinely during surgery. And this is changing our understanding of anatomy as well. We don't really separate the brain in topological parts. We look at the connections uh, created by these fibers. That's how we analyze the anatomy. Why is this important? For instance, you see a normal brain's connectedness scheme here. We cannot examine each and every neuron right now, but we can examine about 20 million neurons simultaneously. So in using this in surgery, we reduce the brain to about a thousand centers and we can view the connection of those centers. For instance, you see a person who lost their sight here. So their hearing center has developed. You see the creation of new fibers. This is important. I will talk about this soon. I would like to show you the relationship between a neuron and connectome. It's like a plane and the airways company. There are 380 planes in Turkish Airlines and when you put them together it doesn't form an airlines company. But when are they in Australia, in Seattle, in India? When we know when that takes place, then there is an information network, there is a connecton. These parts form a connecton, so they create this airline's company together. It is important, you know, you see another airline's company's map here. It's a little bit more... Uh, it's a little bit broader compared to the previous one. It has 383, sorry, it has 383 planes. So they represent a neuron and we see their interaction with one another. So this is an airline's network. It is the connectome of an experimental worm. It is the connectedness network of the neurons of a worm. And this processes information. And this creates the decision-making mechanism of the organism. So how does the human brain decide? It's very difficult to examine that. But this is a brain made of 383 neurons. And we have the chance to examine how it decides. This way, we have this biological information processing system in the brain. And what what kind of an information network or what kind of a mind does it create? So we have the chance to create this experimental model about that. So these, this model received six Nobel Prizes. Let's say we have ten worms and we imagine they represent life. You release them in your garden and these worms make a decision. So this biological information system makes a decision. If we define consciousness as a decision-making mechanism, they create this consciousness state. Let's say most of these worms, nine of these worms, 
went to a grape or fructose and one of them made a different choice. Let's say this worm goes to a breadcrumb or you know to, towards starch. So why do most of yeah, I mean, why does that one worm act differently from the other nine worm, worms? Why does this one act differently than the majority? This is called creativity. So why does this one worm make a different choice compared to the others? For the first time, we have a connectome to explain that. We have a mathematical model. For example, in human MRI, we do this to measure curiosity. I will come to that. So this structure that we call brain is not just an organ that provides homeostasis in the body. It also creates mind, you know. It actually creates this information network in life. And by changing the connectome, we can change the life of these organisms. And for the last eight years, we have been calling this con connectome surgery. We see an animal here in the amygdala, you know, the region that decides whether to eat or not. There are two electrodes that either trigger or stop that region. Even if the animal is hungry, when you trigger the, uh, you know, uh, hunger center, it attacks anything it can find. Or let's say it's starving. When you trigger the eating center, it doesn't eat anything when you inhibit it, sorry. So this is not only true for biological systems, but also for social systems. What we call education is a knife that changes the connectome. So this connectome changing features are about education and all the other cultural elements. It is possible to reflect it to those areas and there is a mathematical uh, formula for this. Let's go on a little bit more. What does this math provide for us? Let's look at the new social results. This science of interconnectedness teaches us that everything is meaningful in the network that it is part of. So if you want to develop yourself, the best thing you can do is to develop the person next to you. There is a mathematical explanation to that. So we actually can use this data in other disciplines of science. Sometimes there are following developments and sometimes there are independent developments. I wish we had time to talk about this Laniakea, the new astrophysics theory, or the genetic science turning to epigenetics. Um, connectome and physics. I talked about Parisi and this integration of interconnectedness to the field of physics. And of course, social physics is a very important discipline of science. It's a new area that is just emerging. You know, when neurons are processing the information, they do this within the framework of a mathematical system. The same is true for societies. Sometimes Societies create this math in a more in an easy to understand way. I showed you the neuron example in the worm brain. You can think of this at a larger scale. You can think of it for the eight billion people. So what we call humankind, that culture, there is this information mathematics behind the development of that as well. So there are some important results I would like to share with you in the last seven or eight minutes. Well, what we call life is this interconnected coding systems. Every coding system can convert to the other. What do I mean by that? On the left hand side, you see a video. It's first turned into GIF, GIF turns into protein, protein to RNA, and RNA into DNA. And this DNA is transferred to a bacteria, just like a coronavirus affecting one of our cells. 
So this E. coli bacteria multiplies endlessly and 25 generations later there is this bacteria and now it's the reverse process, DNA, DNA, RNA, RNA to protein and they get this image on the right hand side. So the loss of quality in this image is because of some technical problems. What I'm trying to say here is that every information coding system can convert to the other. This is one of the main elements of information mathematics. I'll go fast. Every information processing system, sooner or later, creates intelligence. This is where the ambiguity of social sciences lies, because what social dynamics cannot overcome is the second law of thermodynamics. Now there is a new perspective. We have that chance to bring a new perspective with this new scientific paradigm. And there is an experiment about that. This is from Duke University. Again, we see this 383 neurons, the worms, with 383 neurons. This time they put glucose in one corner of the cage and they watch whether they decide to go towards the glucose or not. In making this decision, the first, second, third neuron, first, second, third, seconds, there is this interconnectedness algorithm just like the first bird and second bird, you know, the Percy bird model, or what I showed you in the beginning, those 12 dots interacting with one another. So there is this similar mathematical modeling. And this way, we see whether this worm's decision-making has a mathematical modeling. And this is a simple robot made of Lego. We can transfer this to this Lego. So the Lego makes the same decision. So the, the system gives the very same response that this 363 neurons would give. So in fact, this is a process independent of the body. And they, in a way, generate uh, information. And this is not only limited to the body where it is created, but it uh, is related to the entire life. So the uh, information processing systems would create intelligence and this intelligence does not only belong to the system where it generates uh, this information but rather to the ecosystem, to the very life itself. So I will now uh, talk about a more difficult process, which is autopoiesis. This is the system's capacity to renew itself, just like the gravity model of Newton physics. Just spontaneously, information processing systems would create uh, intelligence and in uh, physics uh, and in biology science that it is called mutation. Because all of a sudden you see something unexpected and you see that uh, in all uh, spheres of, of life, in uh, social life. And uh, Professor Schrodinger uh, becomes aware of this. There is an organic matter and it also uh, constitutes um, um, uh, an, a matter of organs and then there is the entire universe. And how can we transition from one layer uh, to another in this uh, paradigm? And Ilya uh, Progeny gives the first response to this question around 1980s and it argues that this uh, uh, auto renewal system is not valid. So the second rule of uh, the, the, this law is, is not valid. That's why we are talking about creativity. Let me very quickly show you these two examples. So we have superimposed a uh, model from uh, a scholar that I received. So there are 41 uh, pendulums and when you just throw them away, you see different patterns emerging. In other words, different pieces of information. So 41 uh, pendulums. So it's just as if a classroom with 45 students who uh, 
come uh, for a reunion after they graduate uh, after 35 years. So it is uh, quite similar uh, to the pattern of this 41 pendulums. So there is an understandable mat behind it. So the mats we use for understanding uh, brain and of its functions can also be used to understand social system. So this autopoiesis, in other words, how systems create intelligence, is a model available uh, for us. And there are two AI, uh, uh, two AI, they were uh, made to have a dialogue with uh, one another. This was a, a, an experiment held in Facebook, and there was an entirely new language that they didn't knew, they didn't know at all. So now these uh, AI robots only use a language that only the uh, uh, people who designed this experiment would know. So that uh, somehow uh, even uh, uh, made the, the scientists behind this experiment. Uh, afraid and hesitant, so they stop doing it. So this is the wholeness of neurons. Uh, these are the mini brains that we use in our labs. So one million neurons of uh, stem cells and this mini brain uh, emits certain E waves. So they in fact create information. There is inter interaction of these uh, EEG waves with others. And it is the same EEG wave that come uh, in the embryo uh, in, in mother's womb. So any ecosystem uh, processing information would ultimately uh, produce intelligence. So we see another pendulum here, and now we see probability projections uh, where would this pendulum end up in uh, a split second and the entire autoposeosis uh, of this pendulum changes the whole picture and this new mechanism uh, can now be imaged in uh, MRI we can now uh, see uh, the we can do imaging for curiosity well, every year uh, at Bahçeşehir University, we offer uh, scholarships to 40 students out of 100 students. If we have uh, data for 1 million students, then we would be able to uh, image uh, their, uh, their curiosity levels uh, through MRI technology. So we are uh, now uh, facing a brand new technology. It is a groundbreaking uh, technology. So the dialectic uh, has to submit itself into interconnectedness. Bacon, Descartes and Newton signs of the uh, 17th century, they would call it a chaos, but we don't call it chaos any longer. This is interconnectivity mathematics. So the system has the potential to uh, cultivate a new culture because every new paradigm brings along uh, a, a culture of its own. So some of our existing structures fail to uh, find an answer, uh, particularly in this uh, so-called neoliberal system, this extinction and how we can uh, replace, uh, replace it. So now uh, this new uh, methodology offers us new probabilities. Our existing system, as we know it, talks about being uh, smart or uh, being uh, industrious or hardworking. Of course, it is very important to be intelligent or hardworking. However, in my personal opinion, uh, these are, uh, in a way, uh, elevated uh, values, unnecessarily elevated, I would say. There are some other values that we can ascribe to on top of being uh, intelligent and hard uh, working, and it is creativity, 
and benevolence. Just think of a spider web. Curiosity is this tiny thread on this spider web. Affection, passion, dedication, uh, and curiosity. This is something totally different. And then this new system, uh, this new culture, is a non-hierarchical one, and we call this interconnectedness in Turkish yaşamdaşlık and it sounds really nice in, in Turkish and I think it really uh, suits well uh, to the to this festival it, the festival of coexistence or interconnectedness because we share the same life and this is more than enough and this makes a very big difference uh, in the uh, USI schools, uh, there was a research conducted in uh, 1914, and they asked the students uh, whether they feel unique. And uh, they uh, respond, 96% uh, of them respond later on that they consider themselves as unique. So if we use the analogy of a leaf and forest, we always feel that we are a unique leaf. We are so different than other uh, leaves and we always uh, assume that forest is there for us for the leaves but it's just the contrary so in fact the the leaves are there for the forest uh, and leaves uh, are of course mortal uh, they will ultimately die but this is not the case uh, for the forest uh, you will have uh, green leaves, but then leaves will fall, and then you will get new leaves. So I believe with this new paradigm shift, uh, we will be able to uh, tackle our problems uh, in a different fashion now. So these are some uh, research infrastructure that we have used before. Again, we, there is a focus uh, on intelligence, uh, and being intelligent. Uh, so there is this uh, interaction between uh, intelligence and consciousness. That was the previous school of thought, but now there is a brand new axis, which is the uh, relation between uh, different parts, the relation between the part and the whole, and their interaction with the life. So, neuroscientists already observe this in their activities. Um, you are well aware that the people who are colorblind, they would never know that they are colorblind. It should always be diagnosed by someone else. But now we use uh, new uh, glasses uh, to diagnose that. And you see this uh, child on the video. So. We now know that what we see as red is not red indeed, or what we see as blue is not blue color. So what we see as uh, reality is not for real. So that's exactly why we need this new model as we ask ourselves question about how our brain functions. And of course it brings along a brand new economy, law, arts, Blockchain is a direct outcome of this. Blockchain is not hierarchical. There, there is no central bank. And that's the reason why uh, the entire establishment is against uh, blockchain. But that doesn't matter at all. Uh, because uh, time or temporality it belongs to uh, people and not to the, uh, to the space. The same goes for a law. I mean, we need a law or a rule of law uh, which protects life against the human beings and not the other way around. Uh, but since a, a law only protects uh, individuals uh, rather than life, that's why we are faced with all these ecological problems of today. And I would like to end with a metamorphosis uh, you see a caterpillar uh, turning into a butterfly. I really like this uh, analogy and that would require a transformation uh, also in academia. 
So our system is very much based on ownership and we all receive a similar educational training. So every time uh, it makes a round, uh, it is, uh, this, this chicken is uh, rewarded. And ultimately, uh, this uh, chicken becomes colorblind because it would only get the reward when it uh, goes and, and picks uh, its, its feet uh, from the pink circle, so it would never go to other colors. And this is how we are being trained too. The COVID-19 pandemic is still uh, with us, uh, but of course uh, we there will be some new uh, pandemics and this will be the case until we come up with a new uh, life uh, methodology. Again, I would like to use this analogy of a caterpillar and butterfly. They have the very same uh, genetic structure and not all caterpillars uh, would uh, come out as uh, butterflies. The caterpillar should make the choice to become uh, a butterfly. So for that cultural transformation we need every single individual. We will need everyone. That's the reason why I would like to thank the organizers of this festival uh, who made it possible for me uh, to deliver this speech because we need to make sure that life sciences uh, work together with social uh, sciences and this um, new methodology enables us to do that. So I believe in this transformation and I also believe that in the near future, thanks to the efforts of so many people who are present today, uh, will we will all become uh, butterflies uh, as, as caterpillars uh, today. So if there are any questions, I will be very happy to respond. please go ahead. Thank you very much for your talk. Liberal economy uh, and the ethical values liberal, liberal economy conditioned. Uh, if the system continues, don't you see that there are some risks associated with that? Don't you think that we will end up in an uh, unbearable world? Well, of course there are great risks, but uh, it all depends on our choices. Uh, just think of these uh, HES codes, uh, the, um, uh, the tracking system that the Turkish government used during the pandemic. I mean, if I'm under surveillance uh, by means of that health tracking system, then of course this is very alarming. Then that means that we are uh, actually going towards a different kind of civilization. So we have a choice to make. And how can we create a better world? We are now in the process of researching that as scientists as uh, people who have gathered in this festival. This is our common cause. This is what we're trying to do. You can name it any way you wish, neoliberal economy or anything else. This is that. And this corpse is now uh, on all our shoulders and it is only getting uh, heavier. So uh, it is an alarming situation that needs to be tackled right now. And the uh, neuroscience offers us a new mathematics uh, for a new world. So we can take this opportunity uh, to research the mathematical representation of meaning. And in fact, this would offer the value of culture. And that's also the role of social sciences. So this corpse on our shoulders get getting heavier every single day. We no longer need to carry this. We can create a different world thanks to the new science, new methods. And for instance, just think of Newton. Newton came up with a totally new idea. Uh, it was a game changer in a way. And now neuroscience 
uh, is uh, offering us a new paradigm shift and this is the very message that I would like to give to you. Thank you very much. We would like to thank Professor Turka Kılıç. This was um, an eye-opening uh, talk for all of us. Your feedback is of great importance to us, so we will much appreciate if you can use this QR code uh, to fill in the evaluation form. So this concludes our panel sessions. You can now visit the uh, CSO booths. Uh, at 5.30 uh, we will have Jan Kazas on the stage and later at 7 we will have Jumbush Jemad on stage. We would like to thank you all very much for being with us during this two-day festival. <laughs>